coming up on UGTV. Standing committee meetings of the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. We begin with a meeting of the Public Works and Safety Standing Committee. This will be followed by the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee. to welcome everyone to this meeting and public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on any item on the agenda, 
may do so when the item is up for discussion. You will have up to three minutes to state your comments. Please come forward to the microphone and you will be recognized. For accurate recording purposes, we ask all to speak directly into a microphone. Would the clerk please call the roll? Roll call, Brian. Here. Phil Brook. Here. Markley. Here. Kane. Johnson. Here. Bynum. Here. And next we have approval of our minutes. We have minutes from the September 28th meeting. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. <coughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, same sign. The motion carries. We need to clarify whether the minutes are from the September or October meeting because I believe the minutes in our packet were were the September minutes. Yeah. Okay, that's no problem. That's no problem. And the first item under the uh, committee agenda is uh, Justice Walker with a discussion on changes to our uh, transit policy and our fee schedule. Justice, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairman, fellow commissioners and committee members. I'm here before you today to talk about some policy changes for the transit department. And I'm going to start you off with a little statistics regarding our department. Our 2016 budget has been set at about $6.5 million. We operate 10 fixed routes, 4 ADA paratransit routes, 6 non-ADA <coughs> senior paratransit routes, 5 meal delivery routes, and 1 senior group trip route. Some of our numbers from 2014. Our 2015 numbers are still undergoing quality assurance. That's why I'm, I'm referencing 2014 numbers. But total ridership of about 1.5 million. We delivered uh, over 116,000 meals in 2014, and traveled a little over 100 or 637,000 miles. And got some graphical re representation over there that kind of breaks down where our budget comes from on the bottom and also on the top. So you can see a majority of our budget is allocated to our our KCATA contract service and also our fixed route transit. And on the bottom, majority of our ridership also comes from our fixed route transit. So a little, little regionalism to start also. Ride KC is the regional effort to unify transit in, Wind or in Kansas City, Kansas. It's a regional effort between all the providers who provide public transit in Kansas City. And the, the reason behind this is we want to make it user friendly for the end user, the consumer, the passenger. So we're looking at one name, which will be Ride KC. We'll have different uh, connotations depending on what type of service you're usually using. Uh, normal bus service will be Ride KC bus. We'll have Ride KC access for transit and uh, Ride KC. Um, the, the max service now, the, the faster service, will have a designation also. I don't believe that's been set yet. But we're looking at one connected system to make it easier for the, the passengers to travel among the local providers. We're looking at reciprocal fare media, so a pass can be used on our system, on the ATAs, everybody's system, you'll be able to utilize one pass. And part of the reason I'm here today is talk about the consistent fare structure and also the consistent policies. We're looking, again, just to make it easier from the passenger perspective. So our department's recommended changes to the following in the spirit of regionalism. We're looking at fixed route ADA passenger fares, eligible age for non-ADA senior paratransit passengers, non-ADA senior paratransit fares, senior group trip fares, and also operation of our 102 Central Avenue. And I'm going to go through these in detail on the following slides. We'll start with the non-ADA senior paratransit age. There is an effort underway to regionalize the age for senior paratransit. As you can see what some of the other providers offer, we are 60 year older. The regional recommendation is 65 or older. Currently, about 25% of our existing passengers are less than 65. So what we are looking to do is adopt that regional recommendation of 65, go ahead and grandfather in our existing clients so they won't lose any, any level of service. And we're looking to make that change February 1st, 2016. How this will give us... Hmm? How do you do that? How do we do... How do you manage... To I'm sorry to interrupt, but how do you manage to um, grandfather those folks in? You have a list of names, or we do have a client list, yes. And so those people will automatically get their 
until they until mm -hmm. until they trigger that 65, they'll be eligible to utilize that service. Okay, and then I'm it, amazed. <laughs> every new passenger going forward as of February 1st will need to be 65 years of age or older. Okay. Well, I, that's fine with me since I am, but I was just I was like, boy, that's an extensive list. Right. How many people are on that? Uh, list? It fluctuates about 2,000 people, roughly. Wow. Thank you. And who makes that recommendation? Is that coming from the Mid-America Regional Council? Yeah, it's from the, the Regional Transit Coordinating Council. It's a regional effort among all the providers. Okay. Next, we're looking at free fares for fixed route ADA rides. And uh, we're exploring a policy whereas persons with disabilities would ride free on fixed route transit. Currently, they pay a reduced fare of 75 cents. They have to qualify for a reduced fare card. There's an eligibility process. And we are looking to uh, follow the regional policy to allow free rides for ADA passengers on our fixed routes. And again, this is an effort um, set forth by the RTCC. It's going to be region wide. And we're also looking for that change to take effect on February the 1st. And you can see, right? We did about 1,288 trips on our fixed routes in 2014, and we're looking at about 1,700 in this year. Non-ADA senior paratransit fares. Regional fares, depending on the provider, range from $1 to $11 per each one-way trip. You can see the breakdown there. We currently charge $1 per each one-way trip, and you can, when I, when I, Go to the next slide, you'll see what other providers charge. But Independence is uh, the closest to us is what they charge, $2 for each one-way trip. And this information here on the bottom is going to be pertinent to the following slide, but our average trip length is 7 miles. Average cost per trip is $23.71, and our current recovery ratio is $4.24%. Or now, this is the percentage of fares that we recover that go towards our operating costs. And just quickly... Could you walk us through what non-ADA senior paratransit right. means? Paratransit is just a, a general term for a reservation-based flexible system. It's not designed, it's not a fixed route that goes on a predetermined route. It's a reservation-based system. It's uh, basically an origin to destination type of service where people reserve a trip, we pick them up at their origin, take them to their destination. Now the non-ADA means, you know, they're not, there's no disabled component to this. This is strictly for senior citizens. So it'd be like going to the doctor, that sort of thing? Majority of our trips are medical trips. Okay. We also do you know, nourishment trips, go to the grocery store, that kind of thing, and other trips also. Do we, have, do we have a limitation of what we use this for? It's based on, it's primarily used for medical, and then grocery after that, if capacity exists, we'll take people wherever they want to go within the community. <coughs> we'll be trying to give those medical trips priority over everybody else. Thank the you. the uh, Johnson County and KCATA, the fare is based on mileage. Do you have the data? Is this the data that That's tells it. us the average? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's right here. Okay. Yeah, so they're a mileage-based system, and you can see <laughs> our average trip is seven miles. So based on those strip fare structures, you can see where the fares would line up for us. Now, what we're recommending, recommending is a, a fare increase from $1 to $2 per one-way trip. This would put us in the, uh, the national average for recovery ratio. It's a, you know, a small increase, but again, that'll put us more in line with the other providers in the region. These systems are funded, like our, our non-ADA senior paratransit is funded through our county aging fund. So it's, it's locally funded. And again, we're recommending that this fair increase take place on February the 1st. Senior group trips, this is a, a service that's unique to our agency. It started in the late 1970s and we've had a minimal fare increase since then, but it's transportation for groups of 10 or more senior citizens to destinations in Kansas within 50 miles of Kansas City, Kansas. And its availability is determined by manpower and vehicles. It's a $1.50 fare per person per trip. So for a 100 miles round trip, they pay $1.50 at this time. Now our average cost per trip is a little over $234. We limit it, or we have to have at least a group of 10. We charge them $1.50, so we're looking at $15 in revenue for a trip that costs $234. Which again, this, this program was set up in the 1970s, and it's, it's a unique service. But we are looking to, you know, recommend a, a fare increase of $5 per person 
and again to take effect February the 1st. This will put us right now, we're less than 6% recovery ratio. This will put us over 20%. So there, the trip will still be subsidized, but not to the point that it is now. So that means round trip. Right. And it would take it to 650. No. Additional five. No, no five dollars total. Five. Yeah. And again, the age component will also change with the other age, so we'll go from 60 to 65. And our 102 Central Avenue. Right now, the operation of our Central Avenue route is split between the UG and the ATA. I've been told the reason for the split was due to a border conflict between the two agencies. They didn't want to allow us in their jurisdiction. Now with the regionalism, that's kind of passed. So what I'm recommending is assuming complete operational control of Central Avenue. You can see we operate the route from 8.30 to 4.30. They, they operate it for three hours before and two hours after. We pay them, we contract with them to operate the route and pay them $163,195 a year. Based on our projections, we can operate that segment for 100,000, so it'll save us a little bit of money. The route is split. When they operate it, they make a connection to 10th and Main. When we take it over, we just start at 7th Street, so this will give us another inter-jurisdictional route. We'll still provide service to 10th and Main. This will reduce our, our transfers. We'll be able to pick up our folks at 10th and Main and bring them into our community. And we're looking, our, our routes are bid on seniority, so our next bid cycle doesn't start until April. So that's when we're looking to make this change is April 1st. And what's next on the horizon? Under Ride KC, you'll see in hopefully by the first half of 2016, all of our buses will adopt the Ride KC branding, as you saw previously on one of the first slides here. So all of our buses will resemble the Ride KC bus, as you see in that picture, and we're hoping to have that by the first half of 2016. Also, our current bus stop signs, if, if you've noticed around the community, we have old Metro signs, we have UG signs, we have ATA signs. Those will all be similar, similarly branded. They'll all have a Ride KC image on them. Transit centers will be rebranded. Right now, they say Metro centers. They'll be Ride KC centers at some point in the future. And again, we're looking into consistent technology on our buses, so the same fare equipment on every bus in the region. So one pass, you'll be able to swipe that on every bus in the system. Right now, we only accept cash fares. So when we accept other passes, it's a flash pass. The passenger has to show that pass to our bus driver. We have to check the date, make sure it's valid, and then we record it on our, on our log. But this will give us the ability to accept all that electronic fare media. Off-board ticketing, we're looking to have some kiosks at strategic locations around the community where a passenger can buy a, a, a ticket off-board. So instead of using cash on the bus, you'll be able to buy a ticket off-board, either scan or flash that pass. Right now we have real-time location, but it's a little different technology than what the other providers use, so we're looking to have consistent technology. So again, when we share bus location, everybody will be on even playing field and looking to design a, a mobile app where you can you can buy your fare card, add additional funds to it, check on your bus, see exactly where it's located, and just look at the, the regional map in general. So those are the recommendations that I've set forth. I'd gladly entertain any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Any member of the audience wish to address the item? No. no. And uh, this is an actionable item, so I would take a motion to approve these changes. So moved. This is not moving to the uh, full commission for it. It will go up to the Right. It'll, yeah, it'll be a consent agenda item if we have a unanimous okay. approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, roll call on the motion. Roll call, Bryant. Aye. Bill Brooke. Aye. Markley. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Final. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And as we transition item number two, is a presentation on our future uh, public works <coughs> CMIP projects. 
and we've got Bill Heatherman here, our county engineer, and Jeremy with Parks, Jeremy Rogers, and Mike Tobin, and another gentleman. I'm Trenton Fogelsong. I'm the Hi, director Trenton. of Water Pollution Control. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Yes. Fogelsong? Fogelsong. Trenton yes. Fogelsong. Yeah, it's a lot I apologize for not knowing your name. That's right. It's and let's see, who's going to start us off? I'm going to start you off right. because I'm going to do a little intro and then turn it over to Bill. Thank you. Um, and what I would like to say, and I was going to introduce Trenton in a minute, I'm so, but I'll learn that. This is uh, uh, an opportunity tonight for all of you to input the out years of the capital improvement plan. We're going to talk to you about all the different facets of it from bridges and streets to sewers and, and storm sewers. And Jeremy's here. We're going to talk about parks and justice also has a part of this in the out years of, of the plan with transit. Um, again, <coughs> Feel free to ask questions. Uh, jump in and let us know what you think. This is this is your chance. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, as you recall, last month we uh, walked you through the list of projects in the CMIP for construction in 2016, and tonight we're looking further out, uh, 2017 and beyond. And we're also looking, as Mike said, for your input to help us uh, kind of understand where you want to see projects prioritized, what kind of projects you would like to see nominated forward, and, and also a process for handling projects in the future that we'll talk about. Uh, because there's too many projects to talk through specifically tonight, we're going to focus on a, on a couple of featured projects in each of our major categories. but. Um, and we'll use that to kind of have a discussion on how projects, how these projects and others like it have advanced. Um, what has been handed out tonight is just a copy of the debt projects portion of the CMIP. So this is just a copy of the same document you have in your budget book uh, that was adopted in August. And we're not necessarily going to go through in much detail, but there may be a couple of items here that uh, help you follow along or that you might want to ask us about. We're going to talk primarily in the first part about streets, uh, bridges, traffic, stormwater, and wastewater projects. And then after I'm done, uh, Jeremy uh, has a separate piece on parks projects. And then coming back in uh, January, Mike will be back uh, with staff to talk about public buildings. So we're not, we're not going to cover public, public buildings tonight. And our goal, as Mike said, is to hear your input and uh, find out uh, both projects and process what you would like to share with us. In terms of how we have prioritized and structured the CMIP in the past, we have generally tried to use kind of a four uh, layer priority scheme. So first priority has always been to take care of what we have. And so even when uh, the money is drying up, we try to pay close attention to what our core maintenance needs are and when economic conditions allow, we try to be more robust than just the barest minimum. But maintenance and major rehabilitation is always at the top of our consideration list. Very closely behind that and kind of really mixed in with it is compliance with legal mandates. Uh, you've heard a lot about the EPA. You've heard a lot about ADA and Department of Justice, you know, and, and there's any number of other circumstances that arise uh, in, you know, in the operation of our wastewater system or other systems where you know, we, we really just have to upgrade things in order to stay in compliance. After that, we look to provide projects that are our priority but leverage other people's money as well. So whether it's grants, improvement districts, um, economic development opportunities, those discretionary options where we don't have to pay 100% are very important. And then last but not least is there is always just stuff that we want to do. It's discretionary and it's going to come 100% from our funding. And so when we go through this process, we try to keep a mixture of all of these projects in there. Um, during the recession, I will tell you that it was very difficult to keep all four of these, pro all four of these categories going to the degree that anyone would have liked. As we climb out of the recession, we're seeing the interest you know, uh, percolated as to these discretionary projects. We also are trying to structure the CMIP 
so to make it easier for you to predict what is possible and for and easier for you to add projects as we go. So a couple of key points is we have in this budget built in money for future match needs for grants that we have not yet received. Um, and I'll show you where to find that in just a second for at least a portion of it. We are also making a determined effort to estimate our projects conservatively to build in contingencies so that I can't promise that every time we show you a number the first time that it's guaranteed that won't be exceeded. But we want to have a good, strong, conservative number the first time you see a project, be able to give you a little money back when we're done. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way, but that is something that we take pretty seriously. We have a placeholder right now for out years so that you can see about how much money is being banked for things that haven't already been designated. And then to go along with that, we have created the unfunded projects list. We envision kind of a two-step process. As project needs come forward, the first step is to, using a process that you determine, get them on the unfunded but priority list, if you will. And then that way, in a more orderly process each year, you as the commission can kind of see how much money might be available to add that project, say, in the fourth or fifth year out of the CMIP, or how to juggle it around. Uh, that's a little bit different than perhaps some of the transportation and other parts of the program have done in the past where it wasn't quite as clear how you go from an idea to a funded spot in the CMIP. This is, it's some, this is something we've been doing in the public building side for a while. And this is just um, kind of a screenshot to show you how to find a couple of these things. If you have your budget book in front of you, at the on, on your second sheet, which has the page number 390, the last two line items, one of those is a line that call, is called Major Arterial Roadway Reconstruction Federal Aid to be Determined, and it has a total of $9.9 .9 million set aside over the five-year term. That is the placeholder for federal grants that we would get through Mid-America Regional Council, which we haven't yet competed for, but which we are going to talk about separately tonight. And then right below that is residential and collector street reconstruction to be determined, which is another you know, 4.6 million. That is the placeholder for the local discretionary uh, choices. And as you see, you don't really have that opportunity until about the fourth and the fifth year out in the CMIP. We have a similar placeholder like that in the stormwater uh, program as well. And then the unfunded projects, I guess I'll go ahead and jump ahead to those. Those you see on page 394 at the bottom, the unfunded street and park projects list. This was the first year we developed that kind of a list, so it's, it's small right now. Those items were specific items that came up for one reason or another during the budget process last spring. It was not intended that this is the only list of needs out there, but this was the beginning of a list with the intent that we would come back and hear more from you and hear more about the process to continue adding projects to that list. Uh, so with that, in terms of actual named projects in the CMIP for 2017 construction and beyond, um, we're going to talk about some of these, but you know, there's about a dozen uh, projects spread between streets, bridges, stormwater, and others. Uh, this map does not include things like the mill and overlay project, our spot repair programs, a lot of our heavy maintenance. This is more the discretionary projects that have been uh, singled out in the CMIP. In terms of featured transportation, there's five here that we'll talk about. Um, kind of the big one that you've heard about, Leavenworth Road, uh, 38th to 63rd. That's a very major investment, uh, about $14.3 million, of which about half of that is covered through the federal aid grant. Uh, it's a completion of the street, addition of sidewalks, wider shoulders, lighting and traffic signal upgrades. We had a public meeting on that here about two and a half weeks ago. Hutton Road is a project that's been in the CMIP for a long time. Uh, it's one of those uh, that had been delayed when the economy hit. We, we are getting external funds to support that. It's not exactly the same kind of KDOT aid as the Mid-America Regional Council. It's a, a separate program that we get 
through our designation as a county as opposed to what we compete for at Mid-America Regional Council. And this will allow us to upgrade Hutton Road uh, from south of Georgia Avenue where it meets the previous project up to almost Leavenworth Road. This project does not include the intersection, just to be clear, because whatever upgrades we need to make at the intersection really need to be made when we're doing improvement to Leavenworth Road itself. It needs to be consistent with what makes sense for the gap in Leavenworth Road from I-435 I going west. Central Avenue is another federal aid project. Uh, had a public meeting on this uh, two weeks ago. Um, going to take the fifth leg of that intersection out, really improve the operations um, of, that pro of that location. And that one is about 1.3 million, of which about 820,000 is, is federal aid. And then we do a lot of annual resurfacing, and that's an important project in our transportation program. You know, the amounts have fluctuated over the years. Um, you know, the mill and overlay extends the life of the roadway, makes a better driving experience, helps seal the road, keeps things secure. Um, but it's expensive, and we have other things like ADA ramps and other things that have to be done when we're touching the road. So uh, it's always a, a bit of a balance to keep, you know, to kind of keep up with the need there. I forgot what you told me it, run, it costs usually for about a, what? Per block to do mill and overlay. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I would say that on a more urban type area where we run into ADA ramps and we have to do more milling, you know, about 150,000 per mile. And then rural areas uh, can be a little less expensive, but not much below 100,000. And Brandon may be shaking his head. Those, those, were no, those were accurate numbers at one point, but every year we, uh, we kind of have to double check that. Uh, Riverview Avenue Bridge, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But we put this slide up here to, to emphasize bridge projects. That's a very important component. Uh, due to, um, you know, 30 years of council support, a lot of our bridges have been replaced. In the, and, and a lot of our federal aid funding over those three decades uh, was secured for bridge replacements. So we're actually in surprisingly good shape overall given the number of bridges and the type of bridges that we have. You know, we're a very uh, hilly county and we have a lot of heavy industry, so we have a lot of bridges per capita. Um, we're down to a couple of key significant bridges that we're watching, plus a lot of smaller box culverts and, and that type that we keep an eye on. Riverview is the next one listed in the CMIP um, as having a specific action taken. In terms of stormwater projects, um, you know, we have a couple of projects underway, and we talked about those last month. Where we're at on stormwater is we have two projects that are advancing through what we call the preliminary engineering study stage. And stormwater especially, you really need a study to get your arms around what you're even going to do before you can really... Uh, figure figure your costs and so this is a step that's important we have two of these studies underway the, both of these projects are listed by name in the CMIP 29th Street in Ohio uh, you can see the light blue that just shows the existing system in place it's a bit of a hodgepodge the water kind of comes out of a pipe goes through the backyard for a while goes back in a pipe the pipes themselves are not in that great of condition and just the overall function of that system isn't isn't what we would like to be so that's on the CMIP plus uh, 82nd and Haskell area, what's been called the White Hills Capacity Project. Uh, kind of a similar situation. M much older neighborhoods, does have a system not really sized uh, for what you'd like today, plus just the physical condition. And one of the discussions that I, I know Commissioner Markley has had is, that's great, now how do we add more to this list and how will we prioritize additional needs? And we, we welcome some input on that. Future wastewater activities, Trenton Fogelsong is here, and I believe you have a, a, a more in-depth and targeted presentation on our EPA uh, compliance effort and the long-range control plan. Is that on the 17th? Yeah, we've got it scheduled on the 17th for a special session. Okay. Sorry, yeah, on the 17th special session, yeah. And so if you look in the CMIP right now, what you see is a lot of funds dedicated to heavy maintenance, and, um, and, and, and I think you all have had the understanding is that the list of the specific projects that we 
need to undertake in order to keep up with our system and comply with EPA is what is underway right now, the studies for that. And so it, we're about a year away from having the long range plan, but that, that plan will then be what drives a lot more specific decisions in the CMIP in the coming years. And a lot of the focus will be on system renewal. Um, and Trenton, is there anything more you want to, I, I, I guess. You can go to the next map. Yeah, we just want to, I guess, hit home. You know, the, the value of all of our assets, all the pipes, manholes we have out in our system is about a, big, a billion dollars with a B. So huge investment. And all the lines, all the lines up there, the different colors represent our sewer lines. The ones that are in red are the ones that were installed 50 years ago or longer. And when you'd install them, you'd think 50 years would be a good service life out of these pipes. So when you see that, all that red up there, that just kind of paints a picture. It doesn't mean they're all bad, but you know, it's kind of like a car, you know, what would you say a car, 200,000 miles or so. When you get to that point, you got to give it some TLC and come back and, and renew it so you can keep going on down the road. Once, once again, on, in regard to wastewater, we will be back on the 17th in a special session to update you on the progress of, of staff with the CSO IOCP plan. I have a question on that map. The, the area up in the northeast area that's blue, that's 2010 or newer, <coughs> what area is that? Isn't that Farragut? Does anybody know? Is that? I, I don't know specifically if that was all actually new pipe or if that was a system renewal where they went in, did pipelining, and it basically they, they gave it a new install date because they renewed it and kind of renewed its life at that point okay. that may have been a focused effort where they went in and did a whole bunch of lining i can i can look into that and it I'll just kind of stands out amidst i agree it's all the red okay and so this brings us to to the unfunded projects so as i mentioned before these four that are bulleted are the ones that show up in your listing this is by no means intended to represent the only priorities, but these were specific projects that had an action taken or a discussion taken during the budget process last year. And we really have two questions for you as commissioners tonight is, you know, what other projects might you be interested in? But more importantly, what process do you envision as the standing committee with jurisdiction over this matter would you like to have so that as time goes on, we're able to administer and manage this list in an orderly fashion. Because the idea is this is the way you first get on the list is by bringing a project and, and having the commission uh, move in some manner to assign it to the unfunded list. And then this gives you some working space from which to kind of weigh the pros and cons of different projects. Um, and we could talk about those four up there if you like, or we could kind of, you know, open that more broad discussion of, of kind of how you would like to see process-wise go. Commissioner Markley. Thank you. Um, first thing, I would ask that you send this presentation um, along to our fellow commissioners because it wasn't included in our agenda packet, at least wasn't included in the one you download. So if you could send that to Emrick so he can send it out to everyone, that'd be great. Um, that way, our, if anyone else wants to weigh in from the other committee, they have an opportunity to see what we're seeing. Um, obviously, stormwater uh, improvements are always my concern. And some of you have heard my rant before, but I'll just say um, we can't keep telling our neighborhoods it's their problem that their houses are flooding, their neighborhoods are flooding, if we want people to stay in our neighborhoods. We've got to fix it. Um, and I realize that can't hope happen overnight, but I would love to see us doing a, a, a decent sized project every year working through our neighborhoods. Otherwise, we're going to have no one in our neighborhoods and we'll have, <laughs> we'll have no one to, to thank but ourselves for that. Um, we need to create quality neighborhoods and we need to be willing to pay to make those improvements. Our neighborhoods can't be expected to pay for those kind of projects. Um, how that happens, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I w what I'd like to see, ultimately, your <coughs> staff knows, uh, Bill, I trust you. We've been through a lot of these projects together. Your staff knows better than we do what stormwater projects look like and what ones um, 
are feasible to fix and which ones we probably can't fix and what it's going to take to fix the ones that we're dealing with. So you get a lot of complaints through your office or through us that we forward to your office. What I'd love to see is you looking at a few of these every year and bringing forward the ones you think we can feasibly fix within our budget. Um, I do want to make sure though that your office does have a list of those projects so that as commissioners we can go back and say, well, did this guy called in in 2015, is he on the list? Did you ever get back to him? And so you, you have a record of that for your protection as well. So you can say, yeah, we looked at it, it would cost $5 million to fix it, do you want to do that? And we would say, no. <laughs> and then at least we would know that it had been looked at. So if your office can kind of maintain that file of these are all the stormwater projects we've considered and then what the status was, we can't do it or we could do it but it's super expensive or it might work but maybe not this year, something like that, and then just bring us the recommendations of the ones that are most feasible to fix and we can start sort of one a year is fine with me, just as long as we're doing something to move the projects forward. Commissioner Philbrook. Uh, just a side comment is that the K32 quiet zone, I know that, that the people in my district are going to be disappointed that they're not part of that. Just to let you know. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and just make one clarification, though. So the, the quiet zone is connected with the larger study of the K32 corridor. The first piece of that included a quiet zone of evaluation of a specific segment of that corridor, but it has by no means been determined where a quiet zone would begin or end or which, it, or which locations might be included, at least not from within that entire corridor. I am aware that the, that the actual document that's floating around now is a draft quiet zone study focused more in one portion, but that's one of our comments is that, so I, I wanted to make sure that. Well, that's what I saw. And so it's important to District 8 that we consider moving right on down that corridor to Turner Diagonal. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Commissioner Johnson, did you have a? Well, I'd, I, I'd like to know the time frame. So you're asking for our input and I don't want to just kind of be willy-nilly with it. I kind of like to know what kind of time frame we're dealing with in terms of identifying these things. And I'd also like to uh, be, able to be able to sit down with you and maybe talk about historical in my district, some things that have been, you know, that are, we already know some of the major things. I know that 29th in Ohio is coming up and that, uh, but uh, there are other things that have been, you know, coming down the pike. I'd like to have, have that conversation then, but also know what uh, the time frames are for you all so that we can make sure that we're all, as all as commissioners, are getting back with you in a timely manner to get you whatever our wish list may be. I would just like to speak to Commissioner Merkley's point on the stormwater issues. Um, I, have to, I agree with that, and I like the approach that you're asking for, but I recall sometime maybe over the summer where we had this conversation about stormwater projects, I was under the notion that we were going to bring that conversation back at a later time, perhaps during strategic planning for development of a process uh, by which we engage the neighborhood. Remember that conversation? It's been several months ago, uh, but there were three or four components of that, and I'd like to see us talk about that more, but I don't have any of that in front of me from that discussion. I think you know, the general conversation we're having tonight is a piece of that. Okay. And I've had discussions with very various commissioners. Uh, we do have, um, from past studies that have done and just what we've seen in other communities, as staff, kind of an idea of the framework of a procedure and a policy that might work. And part of the, part of the feedback I'm hearing tonight is, yes, continue on and, and be prepared to come back to this standing committee with more detail on how we would handle stormwater projects. Anything else from any of you or any member of the commission? Yes. When you get a chance, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what's going on, going on in Stony Point North with that project. Okay. 
I was just going to clarify your question on all the blue pipes. That was a comprehensive renewal project that was done in that area of Jersey Creek. Oh. So that was not new pipe. It was renewal. A after. renewal. Thank you. And Mr. Bryant. And I don't, I don't know how uh, feasible this is, but um, since I don't send through your budget hearings, uh, if as you're getting closer to the project being brought to the committee, if I could have some advance notice on it or some some details, because usually I'll walk in here kind of blindsided by most of this. So I appreciate that. Commissioner, I'm sure you'd be welcome at our budget hearing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll invite you guys to ours uh, next week. That, that brings up a good point in, in some of the discussions that we've had is our, I assume, but I don't know this for sure, are we, con are we coordinating with BPU when we do these types of things so that we're not putting good money after bad and having to tear stuff back up again, you know? Yes, Commissioner, we are. We have quarterly meetings with the uh, similar staff as to what you see here over at BPU. In fact, we have one scheduled for next Monday. Okay. And then we have our, the quarterly meetings also with the elected officials. And if I could, Commissioner, uh, I'd, I'd like to go back to the point, Commissioner Johnson, that you made a few minutes ago. Um, the, the, you were saying what was the time frame? I believe you were asking what was the time frame for input? Is That's that what, correct. It's, it's now. It's whatever you want to bring forward to us, however you want to do it, emails, memos, texts, uh, anything you want to get in the system, get in, and we'll take a look at it and get back to you. Okay, In Commissioner. That case, thanks for reminding me. Um, I would like to talk to you more about uh, maybe the next school that we're going to work on for some sidewalks. Thank you. So, this item was for information only, and it does take us directly into our next item. But I think, is there more from this piece of the agenda item, or are we ready to move? into the Riverview Bridge Well, uh, Jeremy wanted to Thank speak you. to Park's priorities, Thank if you. we could. Good evening, Commissioners. As you know, my name's Jeremy Rogers. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director here in Wyandotte County, and I'm here to discuss with you the CMIP projects as opposed to Parks and Recreation. Um, currently, we are working on three different projects. Um, Pearson Dam, it will be completed within the next couple weeks, uh, so that's already funded, paid for, out the door. Uh, Wyandotte County Lake Drawdown, uh, the tower there, uh, needs repaired. It, as I uh, refer to that, that's a drain plug, so uh, that does need some work. Um, and then the water lines that run into what Wyandotte County Lake, you asked if we were coordinating with BPU, uh, we're working extensively with them uh, and tying into their lines. Um, those lines were put in in 1932. Um, they're very outdated, and it's just maps and maps of water lines going everywhere. So we're trying to, uh, that's being done in a phase process. So um, phase one has already been complete. Phase two will be done in 2016. And then depending on what work still needs done uh, for phase three. Um, in order to, uh, be ADA compliant. My department every year gets twenty-five thousand dollars to um, uh, to tackle that process. Uh, we're a large department. We have a lot of buildings, parks. Um, uh, so ADA, uh, we have a priority list, and we go through and check them off. Um, some of the uh, recent projects that we've done is upgrades to George Mine Community Center as well as Davis Hall at the lake. Uh, an example of a future project would be JFK Community Center. It needs a lot of work. So, um, as we go forth, and uh, as I present to you on numerous topics, I have four themes that uh, that you'll see reoccurring, and this is the basis of me being the director of, of Wyandotte County, and that is to number one keep facilities as are. We don't need to bring in uh, all kinds of new facilities. It, number one is take care of what we have. Uh, we have great infrastructure here. Now that it's been abandoned, let's take care of it. Uh, number two is, uh, I've spoken to you guys before, but I'm very passionate about inclusive play. Um, 
it is one of the unfunded projects, but I don't like to refer to it as an ADA playground. I want to go even further than ADA requires, and that's called inclusive play or parallel play, uh, where individuals with disabilities can play right alongside able-bodied individuals. So uh, that is a passion of mine. Um, another uh, theme is healthy communities. Uh, Wyandotte County is, uh, uh, we are striving to be healthy, and I think parks is one of the most important uh, processes of that. And so example is Waterway Park with the outdoor exercise equipment. Very, very popular. I would love to see that uh, going forth in, in all, all of our parks. Um, and then uh, building up the trail system that we have, taking care of, um, of our existing trails and making them more user, user friendly and usable. And all of this goes back to a master plan, creating uh, a vision for the department and then going forth uh, with that, that roadmap for the department. And these are some of the pictures that, uh, of inclusive play. And then the top right is uh, some of the outdoor play equipment or exercise equipment that you might find in one of our parks someday. Any questions? I have a question. As far as the master planning process, um, that'll commence right after the first of the year or sometime in 2016, is that right? Yes, it is funded in 2016. We've already started the legwork on that. Okay. Uh, so as soon as the calendar rolls over, we're going to hit that hard. And who all will you engage in that planning process? I would love to engage every citizen in Wyandotte County. Okay. I know that's not possible, but we'll do everything. Uh, we can to uh, hear the the majority of, of our community. Okay, and over what period of time do you? I'm putting, I'm not putting a time frame on it. Okay. Uh, usually, when it, something that big, it takes a 12 to 18 months. Okay, thanks, Commissioner. JFK, do you have a timeline on that? No, that's future. Uh, 2016 is my goal. 2016. Uh, right. That is not funded for. That is something that. Uh, I'm looking at alternative funding for um, okay. so yeah I'd like to stay in the loop on that um, absolutely in terms of engaging I know there are certain there's a couple two or three uh, groups neighborhood groups that would be would love to be engaged in that discussion about uh, that particular uh, center there so uh, it would build some great goodwill in, in the community to be able to invite them or to have some level of discussion with them uh, when we go there doesn't matter I just think it would be great for them to know that we are listening to them as well absolutely I totally agree and I, I do want their input and it's their community center and I want to do what what they want very well thank you thank you and for this agenda item mr. Tobin are there other items that we need to hear about or are we ready to move into the um, I I believe we're ready to move into Turner. Okay. To the next item. If for the Riverview right. Avenue Bridge. So thank you for all this information. And the next item on the agenda is the options for the existing Riverview Avenue Bridge over the Turner Diagonal. So we're ready to hear more about that. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So um, tonight is a revisiting of the item. We discussed it, well, this item was discussed at the Economic Development uh, Standing Committee and has been a discussion with the full commission um, insofar as that in association with the Turner Commerce Center Economic Development Project, uh, we have both the need and the opportunity to take care of the replacement of the Riverview Avenue Bridge. And in, as part of that, uh, we need to make a policy decision as to what type of facility we're pursuing in that replacement. The two options are to replace the existing bridge with another bridge um, or replace what's there now as a bridge with an uh, intersection that brings everything uh, at grade to the same level and provide a traffic signal at that location. Both of those options do uh, involve some realignment of Riverview Avenue. Uh, puts a little bit of a curly cue in the road to help square up the intersection and that realignment is the same in both options. 
um, have had the opportunity to address this uh, with the Economic Development Committee to a degree and would stand for any questions that you may have as to uh, the relative pros and cons. Um, as it stands right now, by virtue of how the budget process has gone, is that if we were to elect to do a, a bridge replacement with a new bridge, it would require an action, recommendation action, uh, tonight for making that facility choice, then the matter goes back to the Economic Development Committee to approve the change in financing. Uh, if it were the preference to stay with an at-grade intersection, no further action is needed, although probably a positive statement by the committee would, would help just to make sure that the engineering side of that question has been um, heard and settled. Uh, by and large, both projects can be made adequate. Um, uh, there are obviously different approaches to the intersection. One would keep uh, Riverview going over top existing Turner Diagonal. The other would bring everything to an at-grade intersection. Both options will work with the proposed economic development projects, with the truck traffic. Um, engineering staff has looked carefully. We think both options can be built and brought to within a reasonable standard, but our preference and our recommendation has been that if possible and if financially feasible, uh, we would recommend the bridge replacement with another bridge option. Having said that, it is fundamentally a policy and community choice. It's not an engineering only discussion and that's why it's proper to bring this matter before you, the Public Works and Safety Standing Committee. And, and with that, I would probably uh, stand for any questions that you might have. Mr. Bryant. With the, uh, the BPU service center sitting right there, uh, have you had any feedback from them about the truck traffic uh, for that particular site and uh, egress on and off of, of Turner Diagonal, their trucks? Um, I don't think we've received a lot of specific feedback um, on that, no. Have they heard about the idea of changing it to an intersection instead of a uh, bridge? Um, you know, we haven't specifically sat down very recently to, to bring all up to date. When, it, when the items had first been discussed, I believe that operations staff were aware. And I, I would paraphrase to say I believe the bridge option is preferred by, by BPU. I would, I would believe that that's true. Commissioner Philbrook. Uh, several several things. Uh, if the, this is kind of a pie in the sky thing, but I want a little feedback from engineering. If I-70 intersection with uh, Turner Diagonal were to be changed anytime soon, if KDOT decided to help us out a little bit and change that intersection to a, to an, ex I don't know if this is the right term, an extended uh, diamond type intersection right there. How w would that affect us much on what we're doing just down the street a little bit? Um, it would not really make one option or the other change in, in staff. So you both options would work. Um, would one be the, any safer future? than the other if, uh, if the diamond were put in? Um, so, so as far as the diamond interchange, as an entirely separate issue, what we have out there for the Turner Diagonal I-70 is a rather complicated, you know, series of loop, looping ramps, all of which made a lot more sense when that was a toll road and when that continued to be the connection to, you know, US 2440 Highway. Mm -hmm. um, when those bridges reach the end of their useful life, the unified government has said you know, we would really like to see a simpler interchange there. There's no need to keep the complete freeway to freeway style to it. And there's a lot of land that is tied up in ramps and, and bridges that could probably be put to more productive use. I think KDOT and the Turnpike Authority will probably be amenable to that discussion. Um, we've already kind of mentioned it to them at various opportunities. There's nothing right now pressing us to make that decision as far as the condition of those ramps, but that's been the general thinking is, is when the time comes, that would be the change to make. 
this particular adjustment of what we do with the Riverview Avenue uh, should work equally well. Well, I had cons some concerns around it being the intersection because when people come off of I-70 heading south on Turner Diagonal, they're hauling it. Okay, and then to suddenly come up to a to that stop that stop sign and or if they want to turn left, you're talking about crossing over quite a bit of traffic there, especially with with large you know, 18 wheelers and stuff, which we're asking to come through that. So that's why I'm asking that question, if it would make a difference. It would, um, changing the Turner Diagonal and I-70 to a more traditional diamond interchange would add stoplights at that location as well, which would mean that, the, that if Riverview were rebuilt as an at-grade intersection, mm -hmm. instead of being kind of the only stoplight in what is other otherwise a relatively long unimpeded journey it would be just one extra stoplight in a series yes. so if i-70 were changed someday in the future it does help make the intersection option at riverview um, more comfortable because it it fits now kind of the character of a series of stoplights so in with that question is when i don't remember the date when we were talking about making making the changes uh, when we were going to start making the changes whichever one we decide to do when we we're going to start working on that what what would that be so there is no timeline okay. for when changes might happen for i-70 at turner diagonal there's there's no, no but i mean for us at riverview well riverview um because of the timing of the economic development project is whatever choice we make we want to be able to move forward with design start construction as early as next summer and certainly within two construction seasons be finished with whichever option we choose so so, so okay. by the by the end of 2017 we would you know if everything is going uh, in a timely fashion with the economic development project then we would want to be in a position to also be reopening how uh, much? Road. How much of an effect would it um, make on this project if we didn't make a determination tonight? I think the biggest issue is that financing for whichever option we're pursuing, uh, with the bonds and the notes and all that, is underway right now. So um, I believe it's important, if possible, to go ahead and make that decision. So the rest of the uh, steps in the financing sequence can be made. If we don't have financing for a bridge option, we would not be able to start construction this late spring or, you know, go out to bid this late spring or summer. And since we only do financing on an annual basis. It, it so putting it off for a month would put us into a whole different cycle. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's right. Sorry, two months. So that would put us in a whole different cycle. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So if I could clarify, the $7 million that's in the CMIP budget for 2016 was the at grade, but the bridge is recommended. And I know those of us that were in the meeting a month or so ago about this felt like perhaps the bridge was the best option and it looks like it's the option that you're bringing forward as most recommended. I know I heard you say either will work. So the, the bridge option we have as a budget um, recommendation would be to budget $8.8 .8 million for it. So that would be an additional $1.8 million on top of the $7 million that was shown in the budget. Okay. The seven million does reflect closer to a full full coverage of the intersection option, but that number is actually kind of designed around a conservative estimate of what the economic development project would generate in return revenue to support whatever project was pursued. And I believe that's a fairly conservative estimate. There are other scenarios if things go really well that show even more than seven million being 
you know, handled just through the economic development recovery. But, you know, for financing purposes, I believe the way it's recommended is if we go with the bridge option, it would be shown as $7 million through the previous economic development plus. Yeah. I, I'll let, I'll let uh, Melissa address the financing part. Um, well, I think just basically what he's trying to indicate is that, you know, obviously when we put these numbers together, as far as um, the projects are concerned, we do estimate low. So it's quite possible that we could make up the gap between what's currently in the CMIP on some amount, we're not quite sure, versus the bridge option, which is the one that you are all considering tonight. And it is staff's recommendation to, to consider the bridge option. I, I think the way to look at the, although there are difficult, you know, difficult choices to make, the numbers that we're talking about here from a Public Works Safety and Standing Committee was um, probably best that we simply decide which option we think as a matter of policy is the best one going forward. And then in the budget process, um, you know, any adjustments to make that work in the short run, or, you know, is, is doable. Thank you. <laughs> I think policy-wise for me, I prefer the bridge option. I think it's safer for our neighborhood. I think it has less impact on our neighborhood. And I think that's what our people are going to want to see happen um, at that site. I'm all for saving money, but when it comes to the safety and um, neighborhood well-being of our community in that area, we've already, as we've been gone through this d development project, um, talked to them about how it's going to impact their neighborhood, and they've, for the most part, been very receptive, which I think is awesome, and I appreciate that from them. I think we owe it to them to try to make sure that they have the safest intersection possible and not to try to undercut it just to do something cheaper that may not be the best for them. And to uh, Commissioner Markley's point, I think she has expressed that very, very well. Do you all share the same, um, in, in terms of you all's recommendation, do you all share the same variables in terms of what drew, drew you to that conclusion? Yes, I believe that's, you know, that, that's been what we've tried to take into account as we looked at the pros and cons of the options. So I think we're ready for a motion, and the motion would be uh, for the bridge. I'll put it that way. Is there a motion? Will somebody make the motion? And the motion would be to forward it to the, the Finance and Economic Development Committee for final, Standing Committee for final recommendation to the full commission. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> There's some motion and a second to forward this to economic development and finance. Yes, as a bridge. As a bridge. As a bridge, okay. Thank you. And roll call. Roll call. Bryant? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Markley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Bye. Aye. And that motion passes. Thank you very much. And I see that, Mr. Heatherman, you have one final item. Information on yeah. <laughs> uh, information on Mark's process for accepting applications for federal transportation grants. That's right, and you're going to see similar themes embedded here in all three presentations. Um, in the in the earlier CMIP presentation, I showed you several different projects in which I referenced federal aid funding. So this is the part that explains where the federal aid funding comes from. And this is important because every two years there's a call for projects and the next call for projects is coming up soon. So um, a little bit about that. So most federal highway money that we get for projects is administered by KDOT, but the actual selection process and application process goes through the Mid-America Regional Council. So it's federal funds. It'll be administered by KDOT once the project is chosen but the act of getting the project selected is through a process at Mid-America Regional Council. Uh, MARC runs that application process. We are members of many MARC committees that has influence over how that application criteria is written. This is very good because it gives a lot of local control to the communities in the Kansas City metro area to work together on how we collectively think you know, the priorities ought to be. And the call for projects happen every two years. They do two-year cycles. 
The next one will begin in January of 2016 with applications due sometime in March. Um, the applications we're submitting then are for projects that wouldn't be constructed until 2019 or 2020. And believe me, it takes every one of those years in between to get a project lined up and through the KDOT process and get all the right away and everything. So this, th these are not, though they may seem like a long time, these, this is actually a pretty reasonable schedule for what it takes to get these kinds of projects uh, up and out the door. And it can include anything from streets, bridges, intersections, trails, safe routes to schools, transit, and there's several other uh, types of categories that can sneak in there too. So um, the kinds of projects that we pursue uh, are varied for these federal aid funds. <coughs> what are our goals as a unified government when we put these together? Um, we want to compete successfully for federal funds towards much needed work here in Wyandotte County. Uh, we take the competition pretty seriously. We aim to shine. Uh, but we're only intending to put forward applications for projects that are truly our priority. So we're not just chasing projects because there might be money for it. We're trying to find projects we want anyway that fit well with the money that's available. And so we're looking for a fit. There are some projects that are just not worth the hassles that go with federal funds. There's a lot of rules. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. And some types of projects, frankly, just go a lot smoother if we just handle them through other funding sources. Scoring is based on how well projects conform to what's called the long range plan. There's all kinds of uh, points that you get for one thing or another and so you know we try to find projects that are going to be something we want and which fits the criteria so that they will rank well and we also do work cooperatively with our neighbors particularly Edwardsville and Bonner Springs uh, so that we can approach this as a unified county and uh, not just as three individual cities So the process, internal vetting of project ideas, that's now. And staff has been underway already with trying to kind of get our arms around what the candidates, uh, you know, could and should be. Uh, public engagement, there's more expectations than in past years that we've accepted and, and solicited public input even prior to the application phase. So we will need to schedule some form of public input in January. There's points associated with that. We don't intend to leave those points behind. Plus, it's a very important thing uh, to do in general. Preparing the applications, these are time-consuming applications. There's a lot of questions and a lot of data to gather, so we can't afford to just kind of do an application for you know everything we might want to chase. We do have to be strategic. But that's going to be what staff works on January to March. There is then another broader public comment period for all of the applied for projects that happens through the Mid-America Regional Council. That'll happen April to May. Then MARC committees review and make recommendations, and we are on all of those MARC committees. Um, so we're part of those discussions and processes. And then the final recommendations go to the MARC Governing Board in October of 2016. So that's the process. Uh, there are three types of funds that are all part of this one application. Um, Surface transportation is the big pot and it's the most versatile. The other two C we call CMAC, congestion mitigation air quality. It's very focused on projects that can show that they would reduce uh, air quality emissions. So it's a more technical category. It's a broad range of things you can do, but they have to be able to really show gain in that particular type of problem. And then transportation alternatives program is really a, a lumping together a number of specialty programs that used to be in the Federal Highway Bill, safe routes to school, trails, um, transit, and some other projects. Most every project that fits under Transportation Alternatives Program can also compete for money in one of those other two categories, but that particular is kind of a set aside to give those kinds of projects their own space to, to compete in as well. Available funding, this is some preliminary information from Mark, so this is not the last word on it yet, but for the, Kansas, for the four counties in Kansas that are part of the Mark application process, there's about $35 million estimated as available. The bulk of that is $26.6 in the STP program, 
CMAC is about 5.8, the TAP is 2.4 million. Again, these are preliminary numbers. When they do the call for projects, they will have official numbers. Uh, even though it's done at Mid-America Regional Council, the money is divided by the states because one's coming through KDOT, one through MoDOT. So we're actually competing against projects from the other uh, areas on the Kansas side. Our target is to successfully uh, compete for awards between six and eight million dollars of federal funds. That's a little better than our population share, if you will, and it's not an unreasonable uh, target for us to have. Um, and it would take at least equal amounts of local funds to meet the obligations and matches. So as we go into it, if we're going to compete for six to eight million dollars, we need to be prepared to have six to eight million dollars ourselves or more, a little bit more. Um, you oftentimes hear 80-20, you know, 80% federal, 20% local. It doesn't really work that way. Um, for starters, the 80-20 is only the share of construction related expenses. So all the money spent on design, uh, right-of-way acquisition, by Kansas policy, those aren't considered eligible. So you have, you know, that money that has to be paid locally. And in addition, the Mid-America Regional Council committees that look at this oftentimes look at it and say, rather than giving a few number of projects the maximum federal funding, why don't we give kind of a smaller percentage and, and go broader? So usually the actual amount is 80% of 80 or something like that. So the bottom line when you add it all together is uh, for every dollar of federal funds we might get, we need to budget about a dollar of local to actually pull that project off. So our potential projects, we usually try to have one really nice big one and probably the two most uh, clear candidates for ourselves is to continue to the work on Leavenworth Road like we have currently planned, go further west. A good section would be to, to keep going from 63rd out to about 78th Street um, or do 65th Street bridge replacement. There's a little caveat to that that I'll explain. With regards to Leavenworth Road, we do have a history of kind of doing major road projects in pairs. If you look at the work we did on State Avenue, if you look at what we've done on Donahue, parallel in the past, and now on Miriam Lane, it has kind of worked well to kind of anchor yourself on one end and, and do a couple of projects in series. Uh, it, it works well for a number of reasons. Uh, 65th is also a very large project. It's the pair to the Riverview Avenue Bridge that we just talked about. The uncertainty there is how bridge eligibility works and how many points you get for bridges has been changing. And so it's not entirely clear to us whether 65th Street is yet eligible. And so we have to finish looking at that. If it is, we think it's a prime candidate to pursue. If it's not, then we won't. And that eligibility has to do with its latest inspection report and kind of what its uh, serviceability number is. It will eventually become eligible. Uh, but with the emergency repairs we did, um, it may be just enough above the line uh, to not be a candidate yet. And that's something we have to evaluate here in the next month and a half. It, it usually works well to have one other project kind of with it, a smaller one. We think 7th and Central would be a good location to pursue. There's some geometric improvements to do there. And then there's any number of other type of projects. We would like to continue with the Safe Routes to School type program. We've been very successful. Uh, with that, we would be looking to kind of package up two or three schools in one package like we've done the last two sets. And uh, we would be working with the school districts to determine kind of where that priority is. Uh, there's a lot of interest around bike routes and trails. And given the money and administration, we'd recommend that the net result be one or two applications max for those types of projects to pursue. And the infrastructure action team has been pretty active at looking at, as well as the administrator's office. You all may have some ideas. Uh, we haven't necessarily uh, made a staff recommendation yet as to which one or two we think might compete the best. But input, including tonight, is helpful in that. And then transit. Um, Justice talked about some of the broader regional initiatives going on on transit. Uh, we've been awarded transit grants in the past. Um, and what Justice shared with me is our strategy this next round is to be co-applicants with the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority 
that is going to be making a number of applications to help support and fund these regional initiatives. So we probably won't have UG specific only applications in transit, but we will be very much a part of the regional effort to secure transit support funding that benefit our citizens and our riders. Um, and I think you will see transit continue to grow as a category that receives funding. And the reality is the more transit gets though, that's, you know, there's a fixed pot of money. So where our priorities lie needs to be inclusive of transit, streets, trails, all of those types of projects. And with that, I would take any comments or questions you may have. Yes, sir, Jeff Brandt. So on the, on the large project, the 165th Street Bridge, will consideration be taken that you're looking at 2019-20, and if Riverview Bridge goes down, that will be the main, there'll be a lot of traffic on 65th Street Bridge until, for what, two cycles, until it gets completed. Yes, we would, if we pursued that one, we would make sure that we would only have one down at a time. Commissioner Markley. I would only ask that you send this PowerPoint along to Emmerich with your other one so it can be forwarded to the other commissioners for comment as well. Will do, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Can, it, can these funds uh, at all be used for any type of planning, uh, like a master plan? I know there's some discussion that I'm concurrently championing in terms of master planning for the northeast portion of uh, Wyandotte County. Um, it, could, could these funds be used for something like that or as, an, um, as part of an overall plan, I suppose? There, there is, but there's a little structure to that. So the Mid-America Regional Council itself has a separate program they call the Creating Sustainable Places yes. program, which is designed for communities to submit applications in order to get planning funding. And that program operates on a different cycle. So this is not the call for projects for planning grants, but there is a separate call for projects. It is this funding source, though, because Mid-America Regional Council will submit a project in this upcoming round to kind of batch together the funding that then goes to support that sustainable places. So ultimately, this is where the funding for planning okay. studies is also coming from. But it doesn't really work to submit these kinds, we, we don't submit individual planning ideas in this round. We do that later. Okay, very well. Anything else from any member of this standing committee? If not, I will just say to all of you, thank you so much for the work that you do day in and day out. It is so very much appreciated by all of us. And we thank you for being here tonight to present all of the information you've brought to us. And we look forward to that new bridge. I think that is the conclusion of this meeting. So we appreciate the attendance of everyone here, including those in the audience. And we are adjourned for this meeting. Do we need a short two, three minutes before we convene as our administration and human services? How about 6.30? We are adjourned. Thank you all.
Public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on an item on the standing committee agenda portion may do so when the item is up for discussion. You will have up to three minutes to state your comments. Please come forward to the microphone and you will be recognized. For accurate recording purposes, we ask all present commissioners to speak directly into the microphone. <laughs> Roll call. Roll call. Phil Brook. Here. Johnson. Here. Kames. Bynum. Here. Marcus. Here. We have a revision to our agenda this evening. A blue sheet was distributed last week adding a new item under the committee agenda. Item number five is a discussion of the grant application processes. I will require approval of minutes from September 28th. Is there a motion for approval? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those minutes have been approved. Our first item is one of our measurable goals segments. Under measurable goals, Wilbo Miller is to here to present goals for Community Development Department. As you will recall from the meeting last month, this was postponed due to the length of the meeting. Welcome back, Wilba. <laughs> All right, and I am here tonight to help Wilba go through this um, segment. And actually, um, as you alluded to, Commissioner, last um, month when we went through this, the meeting got really long. And um, we were all starting to get a little, little tired of our conversation. So what staff did was go back after hearing the comments that were provided by um, the standing committee and try to determine how best to bring that information back. So what we provided you is a handout um, that you've received that's titled Community Development at the Top. And we've tried to take sort of the work that you've been working on here in the standing committee as it pertains to community development and provide those aspirational or strategic goals um, that you've been looking for and then seek comment back on those tonight. So in this case tonight, we really have two strategic goals. The first one I'm gonna go ahead and read right now for you is to provide an effective and transparent CDBG process that allows for revitalization in qualified areas of the community. This will allow CDBG to be used for housing investments, infrastructure improvements, and as a tool for economic development. Community development will do this by working with a variety of community partners that will help the UG utilize funding provided by the federal government to its maximum benefit. So that is what we believe is an attempt <laughs> at an aspirational statement for you. What you'll see on your handouts that I didn't write up here is what we intend to work on in 1516 to help meet that statement. So what we would consider objectives to meeting the goal. <coughs> And Wilba is happy to go over the objectives that we have behind this, but certainly if this doesn't capture what you are looking for, we'd love feedback on that either today or for our next standing committee meeting on January 19th. Um, but we'd like to finalize these um, two goals. The second one being a little more operational um, for you um, that Community Development Department will continue to enhance its web-based information that is available to its customers and future customers within Kansas City, Kansas. So the idea is anything that's web-based, that could be social media, that could be um, the actual website, it could be our e-news, any of those types of things that um, Wilba and her staff would use to get information out to the community. I would just say I think that second part feeds into the first goal as well and that we, as we have been learning things about how to handle um, housing projects or more economic development type projects, we need to pass that learning along to our customers so that they aren't applying for things that can't be funded and so they understand why and what can't be funded as they're working through their own plans and, and applications. So I think the more we can get out there on the web, the fewer questions your staff has to answer over and over again um, as, they're, as they're dealing with applicants. Are there other questions or comments? Just two quick things. Under the first objective, should we add something that captures that we actually accomplished housing investment, infrastructure improvement, economic development? Um, the second from the bottom bullet point under objective number one is successfully complete first utilization of CDB application process. I just wonder if the bullet after that should be 
see actual reinvestment and revitalization of our community by completing X number of these projects or, you know, something that actually captures that something real happened with the dollars. So that's a question, really. Commissioner, are you talking about more of a reporting uh, bullet coming back to you saying? Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to capture that ultimately we, what we want is we, we want something project. up out of the ground <laughs> yeah, right. and, and just capturing that that would be and that would certainly be a successful objective to right. meet. Okay, so probably what we could do is add another um, bullet point is to provide report a report to um, the commission on outcomes at least annually on um, project outcomes. Okay. The only other thing is under strategic goal number two, we'll continue to enhance web-based information. I would say any and all forms of information. I, th I mean, I think the web certainly is key, but all forms of information are critical. So either take out web-based or just add something and other forms of information. That's, that's it. Additional comments? Uh, the purpose for these funds as it relates to this strategic goal, number one, is that specifically for, just for clarification, is that specifically for brick and mortar projects only? Yeah, I guess the, I would say the economic development activities is a little more squishy Yeah, because <laughs> you can kind of cram a lot of stuff under that, but right. certainly the infrastructure and housing parts are more specific bricks to bricks and mortar. Right. Okay. And does that include all of the funds used for CDBG or are there other, other funds? As you recall, we brought this forward to the uh, standing committee. This is a combination of a one-time allocation that was recaptured from one agency plus monies during the budget processes that was not allocated. Right, and I understand that portion. Okay. But overall, the overall portion that comes in from the government, mm -hmm. is it all just for uh, brick and mortar or are there other No, pockets? there are other activities. There are other pockets. Sure, right. yes. Okay. I think the what you're trying to get at is the this goal is related to creating a better process for our bricks and mortar projects, but yes. that doesn't mean that we're not still going to have social service related projects that come out of CDBG. Just the goal this year isn't necessarily right. related right. to that. Okay. And, to and if clear. you're if you're looking for a strategic goal, like an additional strategic goal that relates to how we handle the funding for public service related projects, we certainly could include that. We didn't consider that as um, an item to bring back to you, but if we want to inc include that, again, we have a cap on how much we can allocate to that. We're at the cap right now. When we go back out this next year, I know there was conversation in our standing committee and our subcommittee that was working on this last year on how we handle um, who and how folks get those funds. So we may, may want to have some sort of strategic goal around um, the concept of the public service dollars. and. Uh, an app we don't right now we don't have an application process for that we do have it in our new application to allow for that eventually yeah it's just not what's out on the street right, right. now very right. clear on that but when we go with our new pot of money that will be allocated by the federal government that could be a portion of it and we would want to clarify how many dollars would be available in that area well and I would say absolutely to in my opinion we should and would you like to see it separately or included in the one statement? I would think it would be separately, but it would be part of an overall um, set of goals for the CDBG funds. Just am, I, am I thinking about that properly? A comment for me would be that right now, as, as we discussed in the past meetings, the public service budget is really tied to the annual budget process, a lot stricter tie than this this is right here. I mean, we have other things that go through the budget process where we're, we're looking at administrative costs and demo and public services and other housing projects. This one is just set aside for bricks and mortar right now. And we can do a goal for the other budget items, but 
it is tied to the budget. Well, and I think what they're looking at is more of a statement about the effectiveness and the transparency of that process and how we do a process for that where we currently don't. Well, but I think that's what, is that what I'm we hearing? We're process to, oriented. Okay. Right, exactly. Okay. We don't want to have to continue to, we might as well, if, if we're doing this process now, yeah. we need to be consistent. So I'll pull the wording from up above, reform it a little bit around public service work with Wilbur to make sure it works, but is that what I'm thinking yes. you're looking for? Yeah. Chair, you're, in other words, you're going to make another goal on point goal number three. Yeah. That would be correct, yes. Okay. Thank <laughs> yes. you. I like the first two. As okay. Okay. Additional questions? And again, we'll come back to these um, to update you on occasion as we move forward, but we'll also be... Um, looking to add different objectives and if we need to revise our goals over time the idea is that we would revise those but these should be longer standing than just one year mm -hmm. is the idea the objectives would be annual or biannual okay yeah. okay thank you and thank you thank um you. wilba for joining us for a second month and for your flexibility <laughs> in that respect thank you all right Committee agenda item number one is a new policy, long-awaited policy, authorizing administrative approval of grants, and I'll recognize legal counsel Ken Moore to discuss that item. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The, uh, back in December of 2013, the commission adopted a, <coughs> excuse me, a, a policy regarding budget revisions and setting different levels and different uh, levels of review and, uh, and commission action for different levels of expenditures. But, we were still uh, having where every grant, no matter what size it was, was coming to the, the standing committee and the commission for uh, the to approve the application and approve the acceptance of that that, uh, that grant. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I've done is I've created a grant a grant application acceptance policy, which, to the extent possible, mirrors that uh, budget revision policy. And in no event would it circumvent that policy. Uh, if it require a budget revision, then then that would also have to come to this commission and the standing committee for the same action. And uh, I, I categorized grants in, in three different categories. The first is where, that, uh, where the UG, is, it's a grant less than $50,000, and the UG funds involved are less than $10,000. Now, the, the county administrator can, can make budget revisions in amounts less than $10,000. So, so on a regular expenditure, that type of revision would not come to the commission uh, for action. And so the, the same way is that that type of grant application and acceptance would not come to the standing committee or the commission for action. You would be notified of it because it would be in the commission weekly business material. But there would be no formal commission action necessary. Uh, the next grouping of grants is where the grant is less than 50 and the UG funds involved are between $10,000 and $50,000. Now, currently, those type of budget revisions fall in two categories. If it's a discretionary uh, expenditure, then uh, uh, those come to the, uh, the commission and the standing committee for, for approval. If it is a, a, uh, a health and safety issue, the, the administrator can, can take those actions on his own, and then he reports back to the standing committee to let you know what he did because it, it can't wait for a, a formal approval process. In this case, if it's a core UG function, uh, something that, that really enhances what the UG already does and kind of just, just gives us some additional funds to perform those functions, uh, it, would, uh, it would be reported to the standing committee, and then it, in the commission would be advised of that as part of the weekly business material. If it is not a core function, it's more of a discretionary type of activity, it would require the approval of the, the standing committee and also the, it would require commission action. And then the third category of grant and I need to revise this, it should read grants greater than $50,000 or which requires a match greater than $50,000. In e either one of those situations, uh, they would come to the standing committee and the full commission for, for approval uh, of both the application and the acceptance because a budget revision of that, category, of that magnitude would also require the same. So my, my fellow commissioners know that this is really in response to the fact that our wonderful health department brings us grants every month and Terry has to sit here with us and wait through our meetings so that we can tell him, yes, please take that $5,000 that requires to, no match at all. So um, this is really a response to that and trying to be more efficient with our staff's time and not make them come and ask for approval when it's something that we're definitely not going to um, turn down. 
Any questions on this policy? Just a comment. Yeah, that will be great. That way Terry can just tell us quarterly how much money he's brought in for That's us. Right. <laughs> so a motion to approve? So moved. <laughs> Roll call. Roll call. Phil Brook? Aye. Jonathan? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Mark? Aye. Thank you very much. All right, item number two on our committee agenda is a request to modify our ordinances to prohibit the planting of ash trees. Rob Richardson, for our urban planning and land use director, will present this item. He does not frequent our meetings like some of our visitors, so welcome. Thank you. Um, let's see here. So I think that you all have been briefed on the Emerald Ash yes. Borer before, but a couple of slides here for the folks maybe in the audience that haven't seen that. The emerald ash borer is an insect that's been migrating from state to state, and it eats into the ash trees and, and destroys their ability to, um, <clears throat> to continue growth, and they eventually die. Um, in the, on the Missouri side, it's a little going to happen a little faster than it is for us, but we're really close. It's a pretty dire situation, and if the trees aren't treated um, on a fairly regular basis, uh, the ash borer will eventually kill them. Um, we currently have a, an ordinance and a list of trees that are allowed and banned in the zoning code. <clears throat> and we would propose to change uh, that portion of the zoning code in the landscape section uh, from the list adopted by ordinance to one adopted by reference. So that would be kept in the Parks and Recreation Department so they could add and remove trees. You know, if the ash borer goes away and then the ash trees can come back, then we would remove them administratively. If another tree were to come into this kind of situation where it was subject to disease or, um, or, or insects, uh, we could add it to the list uh, more quickly. Luckily, in most of what we're doing, the landscape architects that are presenting us plans care enough about what they're, they're proposing and what it will look like in the future that we haven't had an issue with this, but uh, we want to have that out there to uh, make sure the public is aware that we shouldn't be planting any more ash trees. This will go to the Planning Commission on December 14th, uh, and then to your agenda as the Board of Commissioners on January 7th. I just recommend, ask that you would recommend that uh, we move forward with this. So will that Parks and Recreation list be available online? <laughs> He's nodding behind you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? I just wanted to make sure that you understood the concern here was that we'd not end up the dumping ground for what was left in the ground of ash trees in the metropolitan area. Um, our staff knows to review the plans as they come in, but this gives them the tools if something gets put in the ground, even though it wasn't on the plan, to say, no, this isn't allowed. Move that we accept this. Second. Roll call. Roll call. Phil Brook? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Item number three is a request to extend the sunset date for the MBE WB ordinance for construction contracts. I will recognize Brandy Wells from purchasing. Good evening. Um, in front of you, I, I laid uh, a letter um, on behalf of the Contract Fairness Board and Advisory Board um, just in support of this extension request and so I just want to take a moment there are a few of the board members that were able to make it out this evening and just uh, pay um, introduce and to thank them for being here I know that Latoria Chin from entertainment um, Kansas Entertainment LLC was able to make it and also um, Rosalind Brown retired unified government official we have also um, Crystal Watson with the Heartland Black Chamber of Commerce. Jay Matlock with Wyandotte Economic Development Council. Jenny Brewster with the Midwest Women's Business Enterprise Council. Jerry Adriano from the Hispanic Chamber, I'm, I'm sorry, Hispanic Contractors Association of Greater Kansas City. And Dr. Richard Bruce with the Builders Association. Um, there are more members that are listed on your in your letter um, in support in full support of this extension and were not able to to come and so we just wanted to provide that full support so thank you all for being here 
The supplier diversity ordinance um, was, became effective in April 15, 2009, and it had a sunset date of December 31st, 2014. The supplier diversity ordinate, uh, ordinance, again, was adopted in 2009, and it was um, based on a 2006 metro-wide diversity study. Division two um, of the ordinance references the MBE WBE goals for construction projects over two Thank you. <laughs> Over 250,000. Again, the original, um, the original sunset de date was December 31st of 2013. There was an ex extension granted for one year, which expired December 31st of 2014. Um, the, the, there is a disparity study that is needed to support the continuation of the MBEWE program beyond this extension. Staff will complete research on the disparity study um, and the scope and scope in, um, for the 2016 amended and 2017 budget process. By readopting the Division II of the ordinance, the program can continue while the disparity study is um, conducted. This will allow us to continue to set goals on applicable projects. Staff's recommendation is to Readopt the Division Two of the Supplier Diversity Ordinance. Oh, let me go back. Um, we are requesting an extension of a sunset date of December thirty first, two thousand and seventeen. That allows us approximately two years to do the study, revise the ordinance, and and revise the ordinance. Um, depending on the the study's findings, staff will present the ordinance before the sunset date for approval and adoption before the commission. Questions or comments from the commission? Yeah, real quick. I don't know about you, but I don't see any reason of not renewing it. No, I mean, I know that sometimes these regulations kind of are the thorn in the side of some contractors, but oh well. You know, because if we don't put our foot down and demand certain things, we're not going to get it. So that's all I have to say. So it basically gives two years, correct? And yes. we do we have a confidence then that the goals we're trying to reach in that time frame will be reached, uh, the diversity study, and then bringing forward whatever the new ordinance might be? Yes. Um, I believe the previous study lasted approximately three years, but it was on a much larger scale and in combination with other agencies. And so, yes, we do have confidence that we'll be able to reach those goals by the sunset date. So that, that gives us the time we need? Yes, we okay. believe so. Thank you. Yeah, and what staff's currently um, doing is looking at what the scope of that study would need to be in consultation with um, Henry, who's here tonight from legal and also trying to get an idea of what that cost would be because currently there's no funding in the 2016 budget, which will start January 1. So we'll either be looking at uh, proposing that in amended 16 budget or for the 2017. That's why staff set the date out as far as it did to give us time to not only get an idea of the, the scope of the work that we need to do, but also the cost with that scope so that we could bring good numbers to you this spring. I'd like to ask if there, the members of the public, if you're here in favor of this proposal, if you'd like to stand, that'll just give us a visual of who is here in support of this proposal. Thank you. And if there's anyone here in opposition, if you'd like to stand also, that'll give us an idea. And then this would be the time if you'd like to make additional comments to step to the microphone. All right, thank you all for being here. And we are ready to accept a motion. So second. Now, are we moving to clarify to accept all of staff's recommendations listed yes. on this slide? Yes, ma'am. And second, do you accept that as well? Yes. Very good. Roll call. Roll call. Phil Brook? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. And I just want to make sure that, that you're accepting um, us bringing back the full ordinance to commission um, so that we can continue the work for the next two years. The study is obviously not budgeted at this point, so that will come through as the 2016 amended 17 budget process. So we're accepting the fact that we are going to have to make an amendment in the budget. That would be um, <laughs> correct. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. 
Item number four is a presentation regarding a proposal from Anytime Fitness to utilize the Joe E. Amayo Argentine Community Center. With us tonight, we have Jeremy Rogers, our Parks and Recreation Director, Matt Warner from Anytime Fitness, and Joe Connor has also stepped up to the podium. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. Um, so tonight we wanted to just, this is a for information only item, and we've got a, a proposed kind of change of use for one of our community centers, which, which we think is is a, a pretty unique and something that we wanted to bring to you, get your opinions on before we move forward. Um, obviously, um, any time that there's this kind of a proposal around, there's going to be financial and, in this case, probably some legal hurdles to, to overcome. And we think that they're doable, but we didn't want to spend a whole lot of time getting to that point if this is a, this is a use that's not acceptable to, to you all as a, as a standing committee. So, uh, again, to my right is Matt Warner. Matt owns two Anytime Fitnesses here in Wyandotte County, looking to expand in Wyandotte County, which we're very grateful for. And then Jeremy Rogers will talk about um, kind of his vision for this rec center and, and this could be a model for other rec centers going on into the future. So, Jeremy, go ahead. Good evening again, commissioners. Um, as I mentioned in my previous presentation, one of my main goals for this department is to take care of what we have. And we here in Wyandotte County are in desperate need of affordable exercise facility. And I would love to put one in my rec center, in any of our rec centers. Uh, they're very expensive. We cannot afford in our budget uh, to build one of those, to maintain one of those. So a proposal came across my desk to use our existing facility and partner with uh, with Anytime Fitness, uh, a, a corporate fitness center. That does two things. It uh, it brings in the need for the um, for the fitness center into Wyandotte County, an affordable fitness center. And two, it keeps me from having to come to you guys to ask for the money to uh, for the equipment and the upkeep and whatnot. So. Um, Again, my goal is the greatest good for the greatest number of people. This, as I'm thinking through this process, it has the most, the least negative community impact. Um, we, the things that do happen there in Argentine Community Center, we have already identified places that they'll, they can utilize so that we're not just pushing them out. Um, it, it's very important to me that we still uh, support what happens in that community center and um, and to make sure that they are uh, have a home so I will turn it over to Matt cool well thank you guys for having me tonight the um, I know he touched on it a little bit I have two current anytime fitnesses in Wyandotte County one of them off 109th in parallel and the other off of a uh, k7 in Kansas Avenue so I've been going for about two years um, but definitely would like to reach farther into the Wyandotte County and I uh, thought this would be a great use of an existing building. Um, basically what I'd be proposing is bringing in state of art good equipment, anything from treadmills, ellipticals, uh, recumbent upright bikes, all the way to your free weights, dumbbells, um, cable, crosses, bench, squat racks, everything like that. So basically you'd have a state of art facility. We'd also provide the staffing you know, to keep it running. We are looking to do 24-hour access, so um, we can accommodate all the shift workers, um, firefighters, and everybody that uh, is working different odd hours or aren't able to get into the gym at normal hours. Um, and then we'd also use what is currently the weight room as a group classroom. So we're looking to kind of, you know, use the multi-purpose room as a weight room, but then have a group class that we can do Zumba classes, um, fitness classes. And I know Argentine has been looking for um, some fitness, they showed that with some of the programs like Zumba that they're having a big turnout, but definitely only using about a third of the facility um, and bringing in a state-of-the-art gym to them. I just wanted to add that currently at the Argentine Rec Center, there's the, the current weight facility, there's a $10 per month charge to use it. There will be, there would be a charge for this as well, but it would be a reduced fee from, from some of the other facilities. So uh, there, there, there is, a, again, part of the existing structure of Argentine Rec is a charge for use of, of, the, of the weight room facility. So from that perspective, it's not, it's not you know, totally different concept for the folks in Argentine. I 
think um, one other thing we noted as we were going through a gender review for this item is that for those who don't know, Argentine Community Center used to be the primary meeting space for their neighborhood groups, but when the South Branch Library was built, most neighborhood meetings moved to the meeting facilities within the library, which means the meeting rooms at the community center are sort of underutilized now, which opens additional space for, for programming in the community center. Um, did you, I think yeah. Commissioner Philbrook had a comment and Commissioner yeah, Johnson next. A couple next. of questions. So what things are we going to be losing the youth, uh, the use of? Didn't they used to play volleyball and some other things like that? We will not lose any usage of the gym. This will not affect the gym at all. Okay. Well, I was just kind of curious what it would affect. So it won't affect the gym. And what were you talking about? Um, the uh, moving, you said you went, you found other places for some other activities. What are you referring to in particular? As Commissioner Markley com commented oh, on, just, uh, just the neighborhood that. meetings, um, okay. uh, things like that. Okay, so. I didn't know if there was something else going on beside that or not. Okay, all right, thank you. Commissioner Johnson? Go ahead. Well, I, he, uh, Matt has some drawings with him about the, the proposed room that's that would be, that's in existence now and how it would look, so I'd like him to pass those out to you. Well, oh, that'd be nice. Thank you. Uh, I would say this is a, a great innovative idea um, and uh, I, I like the ideas there. So I'm assuming there's going to be an MOU between us, UG, and uh, Anytime Fitness uh, with regards to maintenance and things of that nature. Will all that be inclusive in that MOU um, and will there be any cost savings or efficiencies that we'll realize as a result of this potential agreement? So uh, to answer your question about the agreement, I think that's part of the challenge that we're going to have to overcome is to structure it in a way that doesn't put that building in a, in a, in a taxable type use. So we've got to, we've got to structure it in, in, in the right way. And I think that what we're working with with Matt is, is a reduced fee structure to make it keep it more of a public use. Again, we're already charging people to use you know, part of the facility now, so we would be keep that to a similar structure. Um, you know, as far as cost savings and efficiency, I think that um, as part of the renovation of that building, we're going to see uh, some additional savings from energy efficiency and things like that because it's going to be a, a it's going to be a better building overall. Um, and and like Matt said, we won't be providing any staffing for it. That'll all be on on them. And so, um, once we e equip the, the facility with the right technology. Um, the way Matt kind of runs it is, is pretty unique. It doesn't require a lot of overhead on his part. It just requires some investment on our part. And what we like about, about making an investment is we feel like, you know, that that's becomes ours at the end of the day. So that's, that's part of the give and take we have, you know, with, with any type of fitness. And will be part of the structure of the deal is you know, the equipment's his, but the building and all the, all the contents remain ours. And so I think, you know, that's, again, I'm, kind of pretty high level on that but that's and, and he's agreed to as far as maintaining it you know any damage anything like that that'll be on that'll be on Matt to take care of that I, I, yeah every time you say something I think of something else of course okay so um, I'll stop talking now <laughs> <laughs> too bad um, so utilities that sort of thing who will be covering that well right now it's a it's a, a city property so there are no utilities yeah, I understand, but you understand what what I'm coming at. It's like, okay, there aren't any utilities, but, mm, and so your leasing agreement, whatever that, may not call that a lease, may call it something else, um, as a, maybe a consultant taking care of, a, of a, getting our people exercised. Um, okay, so that's that part. Uh, and you say an investment. What kind of money were you talking about? Well... Did you have any? They were working with Jack Webb on on the, more of the details, but we're probably talking the two hundred, two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range to revamp the facility to do this. Yes, you know that that includes some parking improvements. That includes security cameras and lighting and all the things that he would need to maintain a twenty four hour like he has in his other facilities, uh -huh. basically. Where does that fall on our budget, Jeremy? That would come from alternative uh, sources. Obviously, that's not in the budget, so we would look for alternative funding sources to uh, pay OPM, money. other people's money? Yeah. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Now you just got to ask these questions, but I love this idea. Thank you very much for coming together with this. And uh, from my research, I could not find anywhere in the country 
where a Parks and Recreation Department has done this. So okay. um, that, that is, uh, that's something that's important for my department to uh, be the first. And uh, we're, we're excited to go forward with this. And hopefully that's exciting for Anytime Fitness too, oh, to be yes. the first. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And definitely, I, I hope that it will work and make this like a blueprint and hopefully right. use other recreational centers around the Wyandotte area, we could probably do the same. I only have one question about the 24 hour access piece of it. So there'll be a small fee for membership and those are the folks that will be given 24 hour access. And so you'll have to put in some kind of system to let folks in and out. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, Some yeah. sort of key card entry or? Yeah, the, he's, Matt has a system that he's currently using now. It's actually very high technology. It has like heat sensor when you go through the door. So if two people come in instead of one, he gets notified. So he can check up on it, make sure it's not being used to, you know, inappropriately. Also, the way this facility lays out, we can, we can um, isolate the rest of the building so that you can't get into the rest of the mm -hmm. building, the gym, mm -hmm. you know, the other the other meeting space, where you can't get into it, you know, for, for 24 hours okay. access. Okay, right, so. that was kind of my second question, was you're only accessing the part of the building that's for this use. Yeah, when we're not there, okay. as, as we, don't, we don't have park staff there, the rest of it will be isolated, and there'll be a, a separate entrance. Again, that's where the parking improvements need mm -hmm. to come in, okay. but for in and out from the parking lot. Additional questions? Is there anyone here from the public for this item? There's still some people out there. I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, this is for information only, but I, I obviously, if we're not in favor of this idea, this is the time to speak up. But it sounds like there's some consensus that staff can move forward with researching oh, this. this and is right, we're glad to hear. It. And again, our, we, we'll start working on the financial and the, and the legal part of it. Um, you know, now so we can, um, you know, figure out what our hurdles are and try to start overcoming them. Thank you. Great. Thank you guys Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Joe Connor doesn't get to leave quite yet because as previously stated, item number five in tonight's agenda is a, the blue sheeted item for, regarding the grant application processes for the non-CD Beach funding um, the UG administers. Uh, so I will let Mr. Connor present that complicated topic to us. <laughs> just trying to be efficient so I don't have to get up and down. Just, just I like it. Just <laughs> it so this is a, kind of a continuation of a conversation that you've had on the CDBG side of things. These are the remaining processes that are kind of grant related that, that we do currently. And so um, this is the beginning of that discussion. The three that we wanted to talk about tonight was the community funding application that goes through the budget process, the drug and alcohol grants, which has been in existence for quite a while now, and then the UG Hollywood casino grants. Also as part of that blue sheet was a, a correspondence from um, the Slitterbond folks about their contribution and, um, and we, we could talk about that too as part of this presentation today. So I'll start with the community funding application. Um, this is something we've done for the last two years and these are applications that are issued a few weeks prior to our budget kickoff and we've had citizen applications and community applications. Um, there's been no requirements or limits on the request so people could turn in um, you know what they wanted to what they wanted to what they were passionate about what they wanted to tell us about. Um, now, part of the, of the community funding applications were the CDBG ones, so we used to go through those and see which ones were CDBG eligible, move them over to a different process. So now that won't be a part of this anymore, that the CDBG process will be separate from the community funding application. Um, the, everything that was received was reviewed and compiled by staff, and then as we worked through the budget process that year, we would consider, um, you know, consider for inclusion in, in that year's budget. Um, so again, just I'll stop right there. And if you had any questions about that process, is there anything you'd like us to work on, change, look at? So just a couple of quick comments, um, particularly since everyone here is newer than two years ago. So uh, this is another brainchild of Commissioner McKiernan's and I, because prior to two years ago, we had no um, written way for citizens to offer a budget suggestions. The only way they could do that is if they came to the public hearing that we were hosting and back then we we're hosting it um, right before the budget and that has also been altered. 
um, since then. So this application was a way to give people an opportunity to make budget suggestions that weren't at that public hearing and a way to deal with applications for some of our specific um, systems like CDBG. I think one thing that uh, we talked about, <laughs> Commissioner Bynum and I, was that we probably shouldn't call it a funding application because that implies that there is funding available. One of our concerns when we started this process was that when people saw this application, they'd think, oh, there's money out there and we get millions of applications. Actually, the reverse has happened. The first year, we got, I want to say 40 or so applications. The second year, we got even fewer. So I think that's the good news is that that one fear didn't materialize. People didn't suddenly think there was a lot of money out there. But I do think perhaps a different name would give the correct impression that we're really soliciting um, budget suggestions or budget information and not necessarily offering up funding because as we all know, there's not a lot of extra funding in the budget to give out for things that this, the citizens or community might be applying for. Um, that would be my, my only sort of opening comment to that. Other comments? Yeah, and my comment, just to go with, with what Commissioner Merkley is saying is, again, back to what I brought to the special session in September, um, an opportunity for folks to have input on what the Unified Commission should spend our budget dollars on is one thing that could be phrased a different way other than citizen and community application. Secondarily, an identification on our website that lays out what are the grant dollars available and how does one go about applying for them. And those are the, the kinds of things that I had asked us to talk about a couple of months ago and I think that's part of the reason why we're back here again um, so I'll just lay that out there just to, to start that conversation we don't have to dwell on it I think Angela or Commissioner Merkley and I agree it's two different things and lumping them into a citizen community application um, was a good start but we can improve on that. No, I, I think that makes sense because before there were CDBD, CDBG right. dollars that we were considering with these applications right. and some of them qualified and some of them didn't. Now that there, there is none, so this is more of a input into our budget process or yeah. something along those lines. And then to get to your website in, in question, you're talking about grants that are available that we actually have funding for to have Correct. on our website, no matter if it's CDBG, casino grant, That's alcohol right. and yeah. drug. Sort of to alleviate any confusion and say, this is the form if you just have budget input. If you want actual money, these are the only places you can get actual money and right. they have their own separate processes. That's exactly right. right. So are we wanting to, to change the name of this? Am I interpreting that properly? Yes. I think so. I think we want to take the name funding out of it. Right. Because we, there isn't necessarily there is no a pot of money available. <laughs> what are we suggesting? Do you have a good suggestion? Yeah, citizen Certain budget copies. budget citizen input form or something like that. Is fine. And then we can put, put the year with it too, like yeah. 2016. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. I but mean, we we can wordsmith a little bit. And yeah, I, okay. I trust that staff yeah. can come up with a right. decent title <laughs> that doesn't suggest funding. <laughs> and, and that's all I'm asking for is that we are clear with the public about what is available to them, including their opportunity to weigh in. Sure. So this is this is kind of like if you can't be there in person, go ahead and submit this application, right. and you can get your, your you will be yes. heard, right? I yeah. mean that's okay. okay. Anything else on this one? No comments on that part. If not, we'll move okay. ahead. So the next one is the drug and alcohol grants, and this is one that's been in existence now for quite a while, and a, a lot of this is dictated by statute. So, so all of the the liquor tax that's earned in Wyandotte County comes back to the county with one-third of it designated for special drug and alcohol programs. Um, and this is where, um, uh, this is the funding that I'm talking about. The rest of it is designated for Parks and Rec, and then I can't remember the other purpose, but there's there's three slices to that pie. Community Corrections. Community Corrections. Well, Community Corrections is a part of this third, but yes. general there's, fund. Yeah, there's, there's fund. a general fund a piece. Third. That's right. <laughs> we'll, we'll pull it together here in just a second. Um, so of this third that, that, that we have discretion over, um, part of it we do set aside for community corrections and 
by local ordinance, we've established a, a drug and alcohol board. Now, this has not been this is not required by the state. This is something that we've done on our own, and um, and then we the, the board meets the three times a year, and the last time is when they allocate the funding um, of this particular drug and alcohol program based on the, the criteria that the state has set out. Um, annually, there's about 250,000 in the last few years that has come in for this particular piece of it. That's been allocated by this board. Um, so that's kind of the process and that's kind of the, the purpose of it. This is one of those boards that we appoint to, commissioners. Um, and, and also, this is because it, because local ordinance does, is requires this and not state law, it does come to us. So you may remember at meetings, um, we have had this come before us for final approval. So this uh, board that we appoint to makes recommendations, comes to the full commission, we give it our stamp of approval and it goes on. That's how it has been um, done historically. I will say, one of the committees I'm sitting on is a committee where we're discussing all the boards and commissions that we appoint to and, and trying to figure out a process for how all of that works and who's getting appointed and when and how we're meeting quorum and all of those sorts of things. And we have talked about this board um, and, and whether, whether it should be required or not required, whether we're meeting quorum and whether we're making the appointments we should be making. Um, so certainly you're, you're, uh, you can weigh in on that. Yes, but please. Please weigh in on that, and if you have any questions about it, send it to Angela, myself, or excuse me, <clears throat> because that would be that would make it easier for us to have a feeling for what's going on with the rest of the of the commissioners and anybody else out there in the community, because we are reviewing all of these and we're looking at them seriously. As do they really do we really need you or not? You know, and we want to make sure that <clears throat> excuse me that the money is given out appropriately. And I don't want to sit on any, I wouldn't want to sit on any of these to decide it, but we don't also don't want a bunch of people half having to come to meetings that they're not, they're not being able to accomplish anything and that's a waste of their time. Thanks. Just a quick question. Um, for this one, I'll, I would be curious to see the application and the guidelines. If, if we could have a copy of that, because I don't think I've seen that in a long time. I actually used to sit on this board and read these applications, and I haven't seen that application in a long time. It'd be nice to see what are the requirements and who are we allowing to apply for the funding. And my understanding from our meeting the other day is that that has been revamped recently, so it probably looks different than what you saw. So that might be good to share with actually just to the full commission, yeah. okay. um, just so they can see it if they have an interest. Additional questions on this one? If you're really interested, it will be going to standing committee next week on the 7th for public yeah, this, safety. Yeah, this year's committee. cycle is come due. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. so if you have any a particular interest in in that, um, certainly join us again next Monday night here in this very room. <laughs> Which standing committee? Public works and, no, no, no. sorry, safety. Uh, neighborhood, neighborhood, safety. neighborhood and community Yeah, that's right, public works and safety. Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Neighborhood and community development? Yeah, because we're public works and we're safety. Oh, we're yeah, safety. yeah, it must be neighborhood and community yeah. development. I'm so sorry. Confusing. All right. Um, okay. All right. Any, I think any other? Any other changes on this? I mean, this is something, again, you can discuss in your boards and commissions. And yeah, okay. Move ahead. Okay, great. So this is uh, basically the presentation I did about a year ago on the, on the Hollywood, UG Hollywood Casino Grant Fund. And I just, these are the proposed recommendations and guidelines from last year. So I thought I just would go over those and that, because this is a little bit more in depth than the other ones, just to, as a refresher. And then you can you know, comment as we kind of go through. I will say um, we'll receive the, the funding, the $500,000 from the casino in February. That's been their kind of their cycle. They, they cut the check, we get it in February. The process itself, it's up to us. I mean, there's no, I mean, I've always had a little bit of a sense of urgency as a staff person to get it on the street as quick as possible, but that's not a mandate. I mean, we can, we can set the timetable however you guys would like to set that. Um, these have been the priorities for the last uh, three cycles now. Um, there's a healthy communities wind out focus. Um, this is something that, that again, in, in the first year that we did it, we spent a lot of time um, trying to, to hone in on something that, that we thought was relevant and thought that was, had, had good community impact and was still broad enough. It wasn't too narrow, it was, but it was broad enough to, to reach a, a you know, good number of people. So that was the, uh, the funding priority for this particular uh, grant fund. 
um, the size and of the grant and the term. Um, there was a change last year to basically put no restriction on it. Um, I will say that um, I think that there was a restriction that it couldn't be more than a year. It couldn't be a multi-year request, but other than that, the, the minimum and maximums were removed. The, um, uh, the, the selection committee was also changed last year. Um, instead of having the, an outside appointed uh, group, there was individual commissioners would serve as the selection committee. Um, and then, at, again, similar to the alcohol and drug, it, the, whole, the whole packet came back for the full commission to approve um, at a regular board meeting. And that's kind of the... Um, Actually, we, we picked the option two last year, which is provide each commissioner with a list of all grants received, and each commissioner reviewed grants and decided how they wanted to allocate their funding. The eligible organizations, that was changed a little bit too. Uh, probably the biggest change was that uh, units of local government were now included. In the first couple years, they were not. Uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center and any related foundation was also included. That was, they were, kind of in and then out and now they're back in uh, throughout this process um, so those were kind of the ch on the eligible organizations those are the things that changed the uh, grant qualification and, and evaluation criteria again that was up to the, each individual commissioner to uh, responsible for the grant evaluations and recommendations and then we, as staff, pulled together all those recommendations and, and submitted the, uh, the final packet for the full commission to approve. Um, there's other, I won't go through all of these, but there are other requirements and restrictions, of course, leveraging some of the things we, that we tried to, uh, uh, to help you with evaluating these grants. These are some of the other criteria that we wanted the grantees to, uh, to write to and to, to try to target their programs for. Um, this was the... Um, amount of money available to grant last year. Um, one of the things I added to this slide is that we're, I'm assuming a, a continued partnership with the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation. This is the foundation that provides the back office support for us. You can, you can, we use their online system for grants. We use uh, them to tally up the information for us. They actually do the, the uh, it's a minimal check, but to make sure their 501c3 is active and, 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 you know, and, and good. So, that, so when we get the grants, they've been vetted just, just from that perspective, um, that they're a 501c3 in good standing. Um, and checking with them about their, what they would charge this year for the same service, they said they would charge the same amount of money. So that would be the amount that would be available to grant in 2016. And that was just, uh, that's just simple math. <laughs> divide that by, by 10, which is what we had last year. Um, if you divide it by 11, which would be this year, 44990 would be for each commissioner. Any questions on any of that before I move into the next, next part of this? Or any, anything we want to visit about or talk about? Yes. So I'll just oh. say, awkwardly, uh, none of the three members who sat on this committee are on our standing committee, um, which makes it a little difficult to have the best informed discussion because they had a lot of uh, back and forth discussions over it seems like almost a year they worked on this um, with the, the committee that was appointed the previous year to look at the grant applications as they came in um, and there were a number of problems with the original process we came up with that that committee brought back to us and said look this just didn't work the way that we wanted it to and thus um, commissioners McKiernan and Walters and Murgia were charged with figuring out a different way of doing things um, and, and their work sort of culminated in this recommendation last year uh, so I just wanted to to mention that because they did do a lot of work and they're just not here with us today to share all the details of that because weirdly they're on the opposite standing committee um, one of the commission initiated concerns with the the process prior to last year was that the grant dollars were not spread as evenly across the community as commissioners had hoped um, it seemed like grants were focused in certain communities and there were some commissioners that were very concerned about that so I will say from my perspective that seemed to be solved um, with this new process uh, there were 
30 different grants awarded. I think more organizations got grants than didn't out of the ones that applied, and it seemed like they were pretty widespread, um, which was one of the goals of this new version. It also resolved the issue of, of just appointing this committee that spent a whole lot of time and had a lot of difficulty applying, I think, some of our terms um, to the grants that came in. So those are sort of some of the underlying issues that I know just from their summaries and past meetings. Um, I can't think if there's anything else that you would think of to add, but I just feel sort of like a fish out of water trying to handle all of the work that they did amongst those of us who weren't there. <laughs> no, I think that's the biggest change from the first two years to the third year was that was the selection committee and the process that was that was undertaken. We, f we did everything else that we'd done. We had a couple of community meetings. We had all, you know, we used the community foundation still, so people are familiar with how to log on and how to submit an application. The community foundation is also very good at uh, when people start an application, have a question, they can call and it, it you know, maintains their place and they can continue with their application. So they've been a great partner for us and quite frankly for, for that amount of money, I, um, we, we couldn't do it anything like that in-house. So I'm, I'm very grateful for them to, to, to field those calls initially and to, to make sure people are getting their questions answered about their application. And, and Joe, I don't know what you have in future slides. Um, not really last year, but in prior years, we had some discussion because the community foundation can handle additional work. They can put together the whole community or the whole committee for us, and they can evaluate everything, and they can basically recommend the people who will get the grants. But that yeah. costs more money, and we had those discussions in initial years and kind of said we don't want to pay that, but that may be something yeah, the, we want to discuss. The, the first two years, um, the community foundation did more of a holistic service for us, and again, it was it was – you know, seven, eight thousand dollars total. So again, it wasn't a whole lot of money, in my opinion. But what they did, in addition to what they're doing for us now, is that they would work with grantees and basically steer them in one direction or another. There, you know, the first of the first year, um, there was a lot of really good ideas, but just not healthy communities wind out related. So they would really work with people to say, if, if you're going to apply for this, you probably shouldn't do it. You should look at doing it this way, or they basically would would, would work with applicants to make sure they weren't wasting their time um, because there was a lot of, of you know great applications just not healthy communities wind out related not related to the statement that, that was adopted so um, again that's a lot more staff intensive that's a lot requires a lot more um, responsiveness by the staff there at the community foundation and um, but we made a choice last year to basically do the bare minimums and and um, and let the you know the commission would take the calls and the commissioners would as you know review the applications and we just let everybody let everybody apply which is fine it worked out it worked out great could I ask a couple of questions 2015 was year three of the correct. grant process correct yes so do you know for thir years 13 14 and 15 do you have that breakdown with you of number of grants <coughs> applied for, number of grants given? I, I do not. I can kind of recollect from memory, but I know the first year the average was um, both both the first two years the average was less than twenty thousand for 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 a grant. We received about forty applications the first year, closer to you know between forty and fifty the second year. They were kind of comparable. Um, this past year, I think we received in the 50s in total applications, and um, uh, the awards were average was much smaller because there was there was more uh, more grantees awarded. It was closer to 30 for the same money. But I can get you the specifics. I yeah, I'd I can't like to see it. them because my recollection is that I read many many grant applications <laughs> like into the 60s or 70s. Was yeah, I thought it was something like 73 applications received. And I know that on our UG uh, website, there is a PDF file somewhere on our website that lists there the is. awards. Um, I have found it in the past. I wouldn't be able to find it this quickly. But I would like to know, um, I'd like to know for 13, 14, and 15. Um, the second question I have is that the, the amount from the Hollywood Casino is 500000 And if the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation wanted seven or $8,000 to do more work than the 
are doing now, that would still leave us 492000 to grant. I'd like to know what would they charge us, uh, specifically not just to utilize their online application process, vet the applicants, but pull through those applications for whether those applicants have met the guidelines that we've put forward and finally sit as a review committee to bring us the recommendations for the grants. I would be interested in what dollar amount they would want for that scope of service. Sure. And I will just say for me, and I'm speaking for me only, and I said this uh, earlier, I just don't believe that local elected officials need to be sitting in the position of handing out charitable grant dollars. I don't think that's good public policy. And so that is why I'm asking for us to look into, is there another way to handle these grants? I would like it to be a way that meets the goals and the desires that the committee that sat before us wanted. Whatever those faults were in that process, without us sitting as the recommendation committee, can we solve those concerns? And I'm, I'm asking that of the group, I'm asking that of staff. Is there a way to come to a resolution of that without having an elected official sit as the grantor of a charitable grant dollar because those concerns may be very real um, but there might be another way to resolve them sure i guess at the end of the day just to be clear at the end of the day the, the full board of commissioners approves the slate of grants correct so what you're talking about is the step before that That's is correct. how the slate is developed such as the alcohol board okay. does okay. and brings to us a slate of grants to approve and we approve Sure, and I think the Community Foundation had, does it a lot of different ways for a lot of different organizations. Some of them are local government kind of related, so I can certainly get some ideas from them on how they, other ways that they do it for other funders. It, I will just say, I pulled that PDF that you were talking about prior to this meeting, and I, it was a spreadsheet, it was PDF, so I, I had to like count each line, but I counted there were just over 30 organizations that received grants last okay. year, and just over 20 that didn't. So there was okay. somewhere between 50 and okay. 60 applicants, applicants on that list, um, like based that. on my little county. It felt like more because they were really long. <laughs> Great, <laughs> but really long. Um, additional and I don't know what else you have on slides. If we start overlapping something that you have on a future not, slide, not yet. let me know. <laughs> Additional comments. Yeah. Um, I think most everybody knows that I wasn't for this particular process. Uh, I don't mind being responsible for handing out money, but I also don't feel competent in vetting um, the organizations that come forward. And I also feel that if I'm going to have to hand out this money, I want to make sure that it's vetted um, to a higher level than it was last year. I I was disappointed. Um, the other th the other thing is is that although people sometimes feel that they're not getting money in their district, um, a lot of these organizations work across all districts and they don't really give a hoot what district they're helping. They help everybody that comes forward um, that asks for that help. So I guess I don't have a concern about whether my district is getting helped or not because I know people in my district are getting help for most of these organizations unless it's strictly for a certain area. Uh, I would also like to know how much money we're talking about investing in the, uh, in the uh, Greater Kansas City Community Foundation uh, to vet this at a higher level. Okay. I, uh, I want the money to go to those that need it, but I want to make doggone sure that I'm not guessing. Understood. Thank you. Can I s suggest a couple of things that staff could assist us with? First, getting those quotes on what it would cost to do certain levels of services through the through the Greater Community Foundation. Second, and maybe while we're talking to them, um, but it may also just be some online Googling, 
I wonder if there are comparable programs that have different processes that we could attempt to copy. Um, <laughs> comparable, like local government comparable, or just? Really, I don't even think it has to be local government. Just in how they set up their committee, how are they getting those people um, for other grant programs? I'm just curious if there's some somebody else out there where we don't have to reinvent the wheel because part of the issue with the last or the original committee structure was that the committee itself said either we don't feel qualified or the people that were most qualified were involved with the very various organizations that were applying for grants so they would have to recuse themselves so then there were only like three committee members voting on some sets of the grants so it's like if you appointed the qualified people in the community then they were you know hooked up with these other organizations if you appointed a less qualified person then they had difficulty knowing how to analyze the grants in the same way that the qualified people did so th it was a complicated it was more complicated than we anticipated we thought we're going to appoint some people yeah. it'll be easy they'll go through these grants and they'll make recommendations but it turned out to be more difficult so i'm wondering if there's a community that has had a an easier time of it or has figured out a better way that we could perhaps copy or if this foundation has some recommendations on perhaps how um how that might happen sure um and I imagine a, a full service price has got different definitions for full service. Mm -hmm. So I think bringing back some examples. That would be awesome. Right. Okay, I can work on that. Is there anything else that staff can bring back to us next month? Um, besides, what it would also be helpful next month is to see a timeline of how quickly we need to move. Um, I am a little concerned about the timeline because last year's committee did work almost a full year, I think, to come up with recommendations. So we are on the cusp of when people would ordinarily be applying, and we're just having this discussion. So I'd like to also know, assuming we move something forward to full commission in January, what would that timeline look like, and how would it be altered from, from, from last year? Would it be possible for you to send out uh, your report on recommendations before we come before you, so we'll have time to review it ourselves? You mean, the, yeah, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Since we've got a bonus month, um, yeah. we don't meet next month. <laughs> Additional comments or? The only comment I would make, uh, Madam Chair, is for me personally, I, I respectfully have a different opinion. Uh, these, when we have precious few dollars that, that we can allocate into our specific communities, uh, this is the one, one of the few times that we can have you know, impact uh, into our specific community. So for me, uh, I kind of, I, you know, respectfully disagree uh, because I like to have that, uh, and I feel, you know, it's all about the relationships that that are built within our communities uh, with those organizations. Uh, we're not talking about big dollars per se, um, and this is the opportunity that, as a commissioner, uh, while I do understand and appreciate uh, the concerns of my fellow commissioners. Uh, this is the one time where I, as a specific commu commissioner, can have impact with the organizations directly uh, to, to, to better their, uh, their good works that they're doing in the community. So that's my only comment to the whole matter. I, I will go along with the process, and, and, and I'm all for evaluating, and if there's a better way, then certainly I would consider that as well. Okay. So. He so said that much better than me, but I do agree. <laughs> okay, so just to kind of wrap it up from a staff perspective, we'll come back next month. I'll have some specifics I'll send out to you from the last three years, total number, total numbers of uh, uh, grants that were awarded and then the, kind of the average, just to, so the average grant that was, that was sent out. Work with the community foundation on get some full service options with, with pricing, and then that would include comparable processes. Can you also... Um, forward out to this committee that list of sort of guidelines that we gave to commissioners last year because I'm going to give you guys homework as well. There are only four of us here and whatever we do has to be approved by six of us for, by the full commission. So I want us to consider that we may not be able to change the process even if all four of us agreed to, we may not be able to. Um, so I want us to think about if, if it remained as it is today with the commissioners providing that slate what could we do to those guidelines to make it more objective so that those who were not in favor of that process could feel more comfortable? So our homework is to think, he's, uh, Mr. Connor's going to send out that list, look at the guidelines, think about how we can make it more objective in the event that we cannot get a consensus um, to change it moving toward the Greater Kansas City Foundation or some other um, alternative, um, alternative process. So homework for us as well. Um, I am going to ask if there are, well, 
do you have one more? We want to talk about the slitter bond yes, vacation bills. Yes, do that, and then we'll move to the public. Okay, that'd be great. So, I guess to add to the confusion, <laughs> um, as part of the um, the redevelopment with U.S. Soccer and with Slitter Bond and, and additional Star Bonds that came in, a, a payment and that's been made already of 750,000 was made as a part of the redevelopment agreement as a part of that renegotiation process. Um, their original agreement called for some charitable contributions, but never got started. And so this is this goes this is supposed to cover from when Slitter Bond opened to current, and this is a one-time payment. This this it won't be this big again. <laughs> Uh, but this is a kind of a catch-up year, so this is a one-time opportunity. Um, and included in the, uh, in the blue sheet was a letter that, that uh, Doug received from the Henry family about what they would like to see done with this particular uh, pot of money. So you have that in front of you, and, and just for, for your consideration. And in 2016, there will be annual contributions coming from uh, uh, from this partic from from Schlitterbahn. Uh, it, it starts out at 100,000, ramps up to 250,000. It goes up annually, and it maxes out at 250,000. So, just something else to consider, you know, for for grant processes. Um, we've got another another charitable contribution pot of money to distribute annually. And and personally, my thought on this is that maybe we reserve this for discussion at our January meeting because I'm thinking. Maybe there may be two quotes from the Greater Kansas City Foundation as far as if we included this money or didn't include, depending on how they, you know, figure that amount. But it may be, we may have a different feeling as to whether this gets included in the same pot of money, depending on what, um, what structure we decide on for giving the grant dollars. Is my thought. Um, maybe everybody feels differently, but I'm just thinking we may have different opinions depending on what our our decision is in January. So I feel like we might need to make those decisions. Sure. Go ahead. Question on the Schlitterbahn contribution. Aside from the original letter from Mr. Henry, the going forward, were is there language in that agreement that is a little different about how they would like to see those charitable dollars spent versus the Hollywood casino money? Um, I would say there's probably less language than the than the Hollywood Casino okay. as far as it's it's more of a charitable contribution. Okay. Um, it, they call it a donation. Um, it doesn't really. It, it's up to the to the board of commissioners to decide. You know how how the. It's in the packet. Oh. The reason I'm asking is because the Hollywood Casino development language was <laughs> well i mean and it, it, it was it pretty says, specific it about says social services chari and charitable That's community correct. activities so okay all right um, this this is for certain foundations and or not nonprofits designated by the unified government so 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 i think you know as far as i mean from from staff's perspective we'd like to i mean we've got the one time payment issue and then the ongoing funds that come from Slitterbond into the future, um, they could be lumped together and, and we come up with one process or one recommendation or if you, you know, again, again that's probably for next month like Commissioner Markley is, is suggesting, but, but I think there's really two issues with the Slitterbond funds, the way, the way from a, yes, and to I try to get you what you need. Yeah, I was gonna say, I would ask as you're talking to the foundation that if there would be a different price if we included this amount in oh, that absolutely. same pot, we want to know what those two prices would look like so that can aid us in our decision yep. as, as to whether it goes together or not. Additional questions on the Schlitterbahn money specifically or on either portion? Well, it wasn't mine, so can I see the letter? Here, I, I have a copy for you. Uh, all right, assuming there are no more commission questions, there are people in the audience and we're nearing the end of our agenda, so I assume you are here for this topic. If you'd like to speak, be, please step to the podium, give your name and the city of residence, and Madam Clerk, if you would time them for three minutes, my computer keeps falling asleep, so I can't trust it. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, my name is Catherine Kelly. I'm with Cultivate Kansas City, which is based in KCK, of course. Um, uh, I live in Miriam. Um, Kansas. I want to say I appreciate the theme of open 
uh, openness and equal access that I've heard through the meeting tonight. Um, the, in, I imagine in the context of the UG budget, $750,000, $500,000 is a relatively small amount of funding, but for um, the nonprofit community in Wyandotte County, those are big bucks. And so um, knowing how the UG is, uh, is, is focusing those monies, how decisions are made, and ensuring equal access, so publicizing the grants well, so that um, a broad diversity of groups know how, know that the funds are available and how to apply is, um, I think those are really, it, those are really worthy goals uh, for you all as, uh, and for community. Um, many of you know that I was not in favor of the change in process that happened last year. Um, I am, uh, I have, uh, I've been both a, a, a grant applicant for um, grassroots organizations and I've been a grant maker, so I've been on both sides of the equations in several different contexts. And through that process, what I have come to really appreciate is that um, there, there is in fact a, 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 a bit of art and skill to grant making and, that, and, and the trend I've seen over time as, um, as we've better understood grant making as a tool for community development, um, that it's important to not only look at you know, a specific geographic area, a specific uh, a, 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 the individual applicant, but to look at the pool of applicants as a whole, look at how each of those grants interact with the other, and, and really look at how you can best leverage funding. And so uh, the services that, um, for example, the Community Foundation offers, their services are not just um, you know, a sort of administrative, but it, their, their review of grants, how they work with applicants is very much based in, in uh, uh, decades of, of experience working with this process. And so I think they add value that is at that price um, uh, very affordable. So I would, I, I understand that there are, you know, that in changing to a more geographically based or a more commission district based uh, approach, there were some very genuine and real issues that you all were dealing with and I, and I have full respect for that because I'm very aware of the discrepancies there are between the who gets, who, uh, who has access to resources based on, on commission districts. Did I really hit do three minutes? Okay, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> Go ahead and wrap up. Okay. Um, but I think that there are ways that you can ensure geographic, uh, fair and, and equal geographic distribution that um, are, are uh, more a function of how the, how the grants are reviewed, what they, what they uh, address in their application process that could help the commission address it. So um, uh, I will throw out my pitch for, for moving back to the older system. Um, and change, looking at the process of educating the review board, the review committee, and the application form in order to address the, the concerns that you all have around relationship building and knowledge of the community. So um, I do also want to just say how much I appreciate these funds being available. You all are, pro I'm sure, aware of, of how Wyandotte County, relative to other parts of the metro area, has a deficit of funding available for nonprofit uh, the, the needed work that happens in our community, and so the existence of these funds is uh, is really important for for us and and for the work that we all do in improving the community. So thank you for your work to uh, make those funds available and to do it well. Thank you. Any, anyone else from the public like to speak? No, just quiet observers. <laughs> all right. Any other que questions from the commission before we close out this topic? All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Finally, we are to our last item on the agenda. We have a public agenda item. Our last item is an appearance by Elder Vonzel Sawyer requesting disabled parking spaces at New Bethel Church. If you will come forward to the podium and state your name and city of residency for the record, you'll be given up to three minutes to present your item. Welcome. Thank you uh, to the committee. I appreciate uh, 
being able to speak before you tonight. My name is Von Zell Sawyer. I rep represent the New Bethel Church, 745 Walker Avenue. I myself am a, am a resident of Overland Park. Uh, the reason why I'm here this evening is we have a growing church in the, in the metro area. We have over the past six years grown at a rate of almost about uh, 20 to 25 percent year over year. And so we're growing, we're looking to put a new facility um, on uh, land that we have now obtained uh, all the way to 7th Street from 8th Street, so it's really, uh, really big. One of the things that we like to do is make sure that our uh, congregants and those that visit us are able to have the best access to um, our uh, entrances and such things as that. As a result of having a diverse community of worshipers, we also have those that have uh, disabilities. And we like to try to give them the best access, the closest access, safest access to our main entrance as possible. That would be on A Street in front of the actual uh, church. And we're asking for four spaces for disability mm -hmm. parking right there. We have some disability parking further away in our parking lot. But this would make it very uh, accessible. We have one neighbor across the street who uh, has no concerns with this, Mr. Easterwood. Other than that, we have no other residences in that area or others that may want to um, uh, park because they have disabilities. If they do, they're going to end up parking a lot further away than uh, where they are trying to get to. So this is what we're looking for to give that advantage to them and so that they're able to park. Now, there may be a thought process about uh, making it loading and unloading. The issue there is when someone is helped and aided by uh, uh, one who helps them because they are disabled, it is almost better to park, not have to move again, create congestion, those types of things. And again, we are growing, so we're looking for ways of helping those who are uh, disadvantaged to be able to have a safe and uh, equitable way of entering our services for uh, New Bethel Church. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Elder Sawyer? I also understand staff has been working with Elder Sawyer, so um, commissioners, if you have questions um, of staff at this time or, or at a later date, they are available as well. So there isn't anything across the street that would cause any problems for us to have a, for them to have the additional handicap parking, is there? I mean, it should. No, there isn't. <laughs> uh, however, I don't know if that, no, that doesn't solve the church's problem that they're trying to solve for. <clears throat> Say more about that. Well, the problem they're trying to solve for is direct accessibility into the most direct flat surface entranceway into the church, okay. which is off of Walker. <clears throat> um, Walker and A Street, the corner's on the corner. So what Elder Sawyer is uh, requesting is disabled parking spaces on A Street in front of uh, the main entrance into the church. Uh, staff's position is it would be better to create loading and unloading zones there because then you don't tie up those spaces with disabled drivers who under Kansas law if you park there, no one can make you move. So if your goal is to get your parishioners into the church uh, as easily as possible, you need to have those spaces up empty so that people can park, unload their parishioner, get into the church, and then uh, repark and pick up the parishioner uh, when they leave. So staff's position was, you would not solve the problem of getting people into the church that you're trying to solve by putting in disabled parking spaces because they would always be taken up. So if you put in loading and unloading signage, people have to do
do their business, get the parishioner in, get them out, and then move on because you've got another set of parishioners who will need that same courtesy. If you tie up the public street with a disabled parking space, a police officer nor anyone from the congregation can say you need to move your vehicle because I want to load or unload another person who's disabled. The law does not provide for that type of accommodation. Okay. So that's why staff recommended uh, loading and unloading as opposed to the disabled parking spaces. So I have a question for you. That's an assumption that everybody that is disabled is not, that they have somebody to drop them off and pick them up. Maybe they are the one that needs to park. Well, the church already has designated disabled parking spaces on their, in their parking lot. Now, they don't have enough for the number of parking spaces that they have, but they do have designated disabled parking spaces that are relatively close to the most accessible entrance into the church with relatively few barriers. They could add additional parking, disabled parking spaces where they currently have four uh, to accommodate uh, from your perspective, those individuals who do not have anyone to assist them with getting in and out of their vehicles. I think okay. the concern is if one person parks in that spot in front of the little sidewalk, it, it cuts off access. Oh, no, I, I'm not arguing that. I am just was yeah. listening from the viewpoint that he was addressing, and I just wanted to wanted another viewpoint as it went along, you know, if you were that person you know, parking and you didn't have somebody to drop you off, how that affected the thinking. And he told me, and it was the backyard, it was the back parking lot, the other lot. Thank you. Excuse right. me, may I add something? I think there's a piece of information that's missing here. If it's brief. Um, yeah, very brief. Um, loading and unloading is not an issue because we have a circular drive in front of the church itself. We're talking about the ability of being able to park a car so you would not have that extra congestion that happens that would not prevent loading and unloading because we have a circular drive in front of the church. The parking spaces that we're talking about are the disabled parking spaces, are the parking spaces that would be closest to the entrance because the other disabled parking spaces are not as close to the entrance. We're talking about cutting it down by 50% compared to the other spaces. That's it. Thank you. All right, if there are no other comments, uh, staff will continue to work with Elder Sawyer on his concerns. And if any commissioner has additional um, concerns or questions, they can be directed to Gordon Qu Criswell. And hearing no other comments on that, thank you very much for your attendance. That will conclude our meeting. Thank you, commissioners, for your hard work tonight. Another long meeting. <laughs> That's right. Where's my gavel? <laughs> what?